as the spare time bowling alley. Seven people were killed inside. Authorities say six males and one female. Well, we were inside and just normal night of bowling and I don't know where he just came in and there was a loud pop. Thought it was a balloon. I had my back turned to the door. And as soon as I turned and saw it, it was not a balloon. He was holding a weapon. I just booked it down the lane and I slid basically into where the pins are and climbed up in the machine and was on top of the machines for about 10 minutes until the cops got there. Megan Hutchinson and her 10-year-old daughter Zoe were inside. They raced to barricade themselves in a storage room. When I turned around, I saw the shooter right like behind me had just come in the door. Between the lanes, there's um, some swinging doors like where they keep all the mechanical stuff out back. So we kind of all just ran that way. Zoe's leg grazed by a bullet. I never thought I'd grow up and get a bullet in my leg. And it's just like, like, why? Like, why do people do this? I was more worried about, like, am I going to live? Am I going to make it out of here? Like, what's going to happen? Are the cops going to come? And then 12 minutes after those first 911 calls from the bowling alley, 7.08 p.m., the calls to 911 gunfire at a second location. At about 7.08 p.m., the communication center received multiple 911 calls about an active shooter inside of a Schmengi's Billiards. This time, Schmengi's Bar and Grill, just four miles from that bowling alley. Eight people killed inside, one person killed outside. Less than an hour later, 8.06 p.m., the sheriff's office releasing these chilling images of the suspect. Tonight, identified as 40-year-old Robert Card. Sources say Card is a U.S. Army reservist. A local law enforcement bulletin describing him as a certified firearms instructor. Authorities concerned the suspect's tactical knowledge, making him an even greater threat. The images showing him entering that bowling alley, his AK-47 style rifle raised to his shoulder, aiming his weapon. Nearly two hours later, 9.56 p.m., the suspect's white Subaru found with the doors open at a boat landing in Lisbon, Maine, about eight miles from those two Lewiston locations. He should be considered armed and dangerous. Based on our investigation, we believe this is someone that should not be approached. In the overnight hours and all day today, the all-out search for the suspect. The signs in so many communities here, shelter in place. Helicopters searching overhead, aircraft with infrared cameras. The suspect now wanted tonight on multiple counts of murder. Currently, there is an arrest warrant for eight counts of murder for Mr. Card. Um, and the reason it's eight counts, because 10 people have not yet been identified. As those people are identified, uh, the counts will probably go to the total of 18. The medical teams racing into action. Ambulances rushing to the scene, loading victims, hospitals inundated. 100 off-duty medical staff racing in to help. Outside, police guarding the entrance. We had a first patient arrive at 7.24 p.m. And over the next 45 minutes, uh, we received a total of 14 patients. Uh, eight of those patients were admitted to our hospital. Three of those patients are deceased. From her hospital bed today, Jennifer Zanka telling us she was having dinner with friends at Schmengi's Bar and Grill when the shooting began at that second location. When I turned around, we all turned around and realized what was happening. We dropped to the ground. And that's when I think I was shot in the arm. She'd been shot, but this retired nurse still escaped through the back door. So I kept my hand on my, my arm I, like a tourniquet because I was bleeding pretty heavily. And I went to hide behind the dumpster. There was another gentleman there. But I knew I needed to get him. Rushed to the hospital, a doctor she used to work with now operating on her. I was one of the lucky ones. My, um, if the bullet had been in either direction, I definitely would not have survived. She knows she survived while 18 others did not. This was the post on Facebook just today. A wife asking about her husband who worked at that bar and grill. Tracy Walker writing about her husband, Joseph. Please pray. I haven't heard anything about my husband. He was at Schmengi's. Tonight, after waiting 14 hours for word, the family learned he was killed. His father, Leroy Walker, describes the emptiness. Your whole body, everything goes out of you. Your heart goes flip-flop and you got, it feels like some, there's a vice in you. Your head can't take it and 
and uh, you just feel like you're going to blow up. That's what you feel like, or blow out. I'm not sure which way, but but you you got no legs. Your mind can't. You're thinking, but you're not knowing what you're thinking. You're not. You don't even know where you're going. Yeah, it's it's a it's an empty. It's uh, it's just hard. I don't know how some people. I've I've listened to people try to explain when something happens in these shootouts and stuff. I don't know how they do it. I I can't explain it, tell you the truth, I can't. I can tell you, though, it's empty. It's empty. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I'm sorry. Uh, well, we'll have to just wait and see, I guess. Leroy is a local councilman here. He says state police told the family that his son was a hero who grabbed a knife behind that bar to try to stop the gunman, but that he was killed. Leroy's family showed us the article when his son was a hero back in high school, helping to stop a thief at a local jewelry store. His father was not surprised to learn that his son tried to help again. He says he'll miss the visits from his son after he would finish work. And those visits at night when he got off shift, you'll miss those kill most. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna kill me. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the only other thing is the, the other poor people that are out there doing the same thing as I'm doing right now, having no place to really go, or, or feel like you've got a place to go, just emptiness. It's a, I feel so sorry for them too. Most of them are my friends, because they're Joe's friends, my friends, we played pool, we played darts, we did all of that together. And, uh, I know some of them. I know one or two of them that were shot and in the hospital and trying to, you know, heal from it. And one is dead. Shot him outside of the place. Uh, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Just so much grief there. Our thanks to David Muir for that. The names and faces of the victims are now emerging, among them a youth bowling coach, a loving husband and grandfather, a mother working part-time at the bowling alley, and the cousin who witnessed it all. I had the chance to speak with the family of one of the victims, Trisha Aslin, who was in the bowling alley when the shooter opened fire. Tonight, her cousin Tammy and Tammy's daughter, Tony, are remembering Trisha and talking about the harrowing moments they both experienced inside that bowling alley. Do you feel like you're still in shock? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I go through my moments where I can feel my emotions are basically closed, mm. where you kind of block them. And then other moments where the, you know, you let the feelings come in. Mm-hmm. But it's um, a very surreal thing. Surreal. How have you been explaining this to Tony? The sad part of it is, is, um, Tony and I got lost in the scuffle. So I didn't know where she was. Um, so I didn't get a chance to really talk with her um, that well or that much till this morning. And um, we, I asked her how she's feeling and how she's doing. And she seems to be doing okay, surprisingly better than I thought. But I also can tell that she hasn't really processed it yet, Mm -hmm. that she probably doesn't understand the intensity of it all. Tony, how did you describe it a little while ago? Like a horror movie. Can you just explain what what happened from your perspective last night? I saw someone get shot, and I saw, like, blood splatter everywhere, and they just fell off their chair and they weren't moving and then one of the bowling coaches said to like get over here because I guess he knew what a gunshot sounded like and so I ran out the exit I didn't know where my mom was and I ran with three other people to subway and so there were a lot of kids right because it was a kids bowling league yes right and so did a lot of the kids run out too? Were you able to see that? I wasn't sure because I was near the candle pin section. There's like big balls, a little, like I think four lanes of big balls and I was bowling and I couldn't tell if like there was other people like going out 
like getting shot. All I saw was that one person, and I just ran. And what were you? Were you screaming? Were you crying? What were... I was trying to stay a little bit calmer, so I wasn't like really hyped up. But then when I realized my mom wasn't fine, following me, I kind of started crying. Mm. And then when did you see mom? Mm. Not till this morning. This morning. Mm. And what what was that like seeing that mom was safe? Mm. Happy. Yeah. So, so mom, tell me about from your perspective. You're taking your daughter out for a kids bowling league it's on something a, we do every Wednesday. Ordinary Wednesday. It's night. an ordinary Wednesday. When did you realize something is terribly wrong here? You know, it's sad to say that it took me longer than I expected. Because, you know, we we talk to everybody talks and says that, you know, you hear gunshots, you're, you know that you're gonna, you know, run, hide or whatever. But when you haven't heard gunshots before and it's the first time you hear, you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So here we are in a bowling alley and we hear this loud, this loudest sound. It's, I guess you could attribute it to almost like a firework going off inside, but like really nearby. And we all heard that sound, and I didn't know what it was, and I thought, my God, did something happen to the machinery? Did somebody fall on the bowling alley? Is, you know, is everything okay? Then as I got up, I heard a second shot, but I didn't know it was a shot still at that point. And I saw people scurrying down the bowling alley, um, lanes themselves, and people scurrying around, and then I saw <laughs> a few people behind the counter, at least one person behind the counter fall. And I couldn't tell if they were ducking or if they had been injured. And people were coming towards me. And I see people behind me like scurrying, but I'm still more or less kind of frozen, which is kind of scary to think about. But I panicked for that brief moment. And also then also wondering where she is, but then realizing I can't find her. I don't know where she is, but I have to get safe because at that point I had seen him and he was pointing the gun towards our direction or starting to go towards that direction. And uh, that's when I fell on the ground and I, I hurt myself. But eventually we um, got a table to flip over and we had a booth in that corner that we used to put a wall up. But it really isn't much protection. And, that's, and you know it, you know. And the whole time I'm thinking, we're sitting ducks. Um, and we can hear more shots going off. But I'm the whole time I'm wondering where she is. And I called 911 at um, some point. I used, I didn't know where my phone was at that point. It, it had flown. Um, and one of the kids that bowls with us, um, I was, he was laying behind me. And I used his phone to call 911. And there was another couple of individuals in our group where we were hiding that had also, I guess, tried to reach 911. But yeah, it, um, it still doesn't feel real. Mm. Like, it just doesn't feel real. Did you think you were gonna die? I didn't have that thought at that moment because I think I was more worried about what had happened to her and I think when it's happening that quickly like that, I don't know if, you certainly panic about dying and you certainly think that it's gonna happen, but there's, it's amazing how many thoughts can run through your head and yet still not be the thoughts that every might, everybody might think it'd be, it'd be like, you know, your immediate fear of dying. But I, like I said, my concern was more on where she was and whether or not she was safe because I, had a fear that she had ran towards the sounds too, because like I said, a few of us adults that were sitting next to each other when we heard it initially responded like somebody needed help or we're looking to make. We do have breaking news at this moment. Our Whit Johnson joins us now. He's outside of a home linked to the suspect. There were reportedly explosions heard there earlier, a very active scene there, Whit. Tell us what's happening. 
Lindsay, there have been a, a series of intense developments in just the past few minutes here. We saw a large column of police vehicles roll up, including some SWAT vehicles. You can't hear it, but we're actually hearing the SWAT team yell out commands on a loudspeaker. We had to turn off all of our lights because the officers said it was dangerous for the SWAT teams that we saw going in. These officers started marching off into the meadow in the dark with multiple drones overhead. And we're listening to the commands right now. And we've actually heard police officers say, Robert Card, you're under arrest. We know you're in there. Come outside with your hands up. Um, we also heard officers, sorry, we're hearing, we're hearing audio coming from some other places. We also heard officers, can we, turn, can we turn that off? Can we turn that off? We also heard officers asking if there was anybody else inside the home and if he was armed. So it's quieted down a little bit. But Lindsay, all of this really just escalated in the last 30 minutes or so. The police came up in this big column calmly. We saw a number of armored officers, uh, excuse me, armed officers get out of these SWAT vehicles and then just march off into the darkness with drones overhead. So stand by one second. I'm trying to listen to what they're saying. Did, have we heard a command since then? We haven't. Okay, so it's gone quiet for the past few seconds. But, Lindsay, to put things in perspective, this is the same home that we rushed out to earlier today because there were explosions heard from this property. Uh, we know, based on record checks, that this was a property that was connected with the suspect. Wait. Hold on. You need to come outside now with nothing in your hands, your hands in the air. Another round of commands there, but again, Lindsay, to put this in perspective, we heard those, uh, there were reports of those explosions earlier in the day, and law enforcement officials told us that those were likely flash bang grenades, which are often standard procedure at that time. We didn't know if they actually found anything inside the home, and the strange thing, when we were getting ready for our live shot for World News Tonight, all of the police officers <clears throat> left the property, and it was pretty much a, a black hole behind us here. And then about 15 minutes later, they rolled right back in and everything escalated really quickly. We know that we can actually see the red lights of multiple drones flying overhead. We know that there were helicopters and there was even a plane that was up above too. Um, and Lindsay, forgive me, if you can st still hear me, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm just trying to listen to what the officers are saying. Wit, give us a sense of the house. Are there any lights on inside of the house or the house is completely dark? What are you seeing? From my vantage point, I can't see any lights on inside the house. Most of the light that we're seeing <clears throat> is from spotlights that the police vehicles, are, wait, more commands. We don't want to hurt anyone. We need you to come outside now. We again, we do not want to hurt anyone. So they're they're really. It appears as if officers are being patient with this person that they believe is inside the home. We did hear earlier. They said Robert Card by name. They said we know you're in there. That of course is the 40-year-old suspect who's accused of carrying out this deadly rampage. And, and Lindsay, just to finish your point. <clears throat> no, we do not see any lights on inside the home, but we did have producers who were coming to this property over the past few days. And in fact, one of our producers was chased off uh, the property, uh, didn't know somebody was there. Um, and then somebody came out, a woman, um, and asked our producer to leave. And of course, we, we do that. Um, wasn't clear if that was a, a family member, but it was this exact same home. So just a day ago, somebody was living inside that home that officers are now surrounding. So again, we don't know exactly what's going on, but it appears as if at least officers think that they have someone cornered in this home at the moment. And, and we, we know that you've been in this area. Go ahead, Lindsay. We, we know that. We, we know that you've been in this area for quite some time and the locations last night between Schmengi's Bar and Grill and the bowling alley about three miles apart. Do you have any sense of, of where this house is in relation to the bowling alley and the bar? <clears throat> 
This house, and, and remind me, Will, if you're there, I'm going to ask you, live, Will, our producer here, how far is this house? We've been driving around quite a bit today between Lewiston and then Lisbon, uh, where the suspect's vehicle was found. And this area is, what, like another 10 miles away from, from where that is? Yes. About 15. This 15 miles away from where the shootings occurred. Um, and, and there, Lindsay, there are multiple homes tied to the suspect uh, in this same neighborhood. So we were actually, right before our World News live shot, we were at a different home. And there was a lot of activity there. We saw SWAT teams. We saw uh, police officers carrying long guns. And so we were there getting ready to do some live shots. And that's when we heard the reports of the explosions at this property. And we all rushed over here along with a lot of other reporters. But again, it, this has kind of been the situation over the past 24 hours. Uh, something happens in, in one part of town. You see a bunch of police officers and vehicles. And you know everybody races over there to see what happens. And it turns out to be nothing. Um, but this is the most intense development that we have seen so far. A full column and, and we, of we know that vehicles and police vehicles coming through. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Lindsay, go uh, ahead. We know that you've been... Uh, we know that uh, you are seeing a, a large uh, amount of police presence and, and hearing these commands intermittently. Have they suggested that they're going to go in or they're just asking him to come out? So far, it appears they're really trying to plead with this person to come out of the home. Um, they've been patient. A lot of the commit. He's. They're being very calm and patient. He just said, "I do realize this may be intimidating for you, but we need you to come outside." So, honestly, the. The posture from law enforcement has been pretty calm and under control. The officers rolled up here quietly. Um, the commands have been measured. Um, we have not seen that real sense of urgency yet. At this point, it appears as if the officers are really trying to plead with this individual to come out of the house, and they're laying out how it would go. They would say, we need, we need you to put your hands up. We need you to walk like this. We need you to, to approach this specific vehicle. And again, the lights that we're seeing, we believe, are spotlights. We're doing this for our safety and everyone else's safety. Again, they're being very patient. We would like to speak with you. They said, we would like to speak with you. So trying to engage in a conversation uh, with this individual. And, and so it does sound that they are very confident uh, that the suspect is likely inside of that home. As far as the explosions that you heard, perhaps from that home or a nearby home earlier, have you gotten any sense of what that was about? Yes, we did get some uh, reports from law enforcement sources that those were likely flashbang grenades that they said were often standard operating procedure with this type of search. They would go in, they, they'd make the loud noise, they would check to see if there was any response inside that home. Um, but at that time, again, it, there was no follow-up from law enforcement as to whether or not they even found something inside the home. And we know that scenes similar to that did play out at multiple properties in this area associated with the suspect. And again, things have gone quiet and, and, again for just a moment. Oh, go ahead. At the area where you are, is this a neighborhood with lots of homes nearby? Is this a, a wooded area? Kind of just describe the lay of the land for us. This is a really rural area, and I know it's hard to see in the dark, but to my left here, basically open fields. There is one home uh, behind us here and a bunch of reporters are essentially set up uh, near the driveway of that home. But it's pretty much open fields as far as the eye can see. We have a main road that comes through and it's just dotted with properties here and there. But beyond um, what appears to be, and it's hard to tell, grassland, farmland, there are thick wooded areas um, and in the moonlight you can't see in your camera but in the moonlight you know on the horizon we can see very very tall trees and this has been part of the concern here Lindsay over the course of days that this is a guy with military experience with it with training uh, as a weapons instructor instructor and a lot of knowledge about the backwoods of this area and so they had all these different mm. agencies um, more than a hundred uh, law enforcement agencies participating they had 
aircraft with infrared technology to be able to spot light or a heat signature in the woods. And so all of that was incredibly important in trying to locate someone. But here we are at the end of the day, appearing to be at the property of this suspect. And Whit, for those who are just joining us, I mean, this is really, as far as breaking news goes, this is riveting. We're here, you're there on the scene as this is unfolding. Just want to reset for a moment. For those who are just joining us, you were there when the SWAT teams first started rolling up. Just kind of uh, take us back from the beginning of, of what happened at this house. Yeah, and again, to remind our viewers here, part of the reason why we're in the dark, we're just using a cell phone camera right now uh, for a light above the camera because the SWAT team came through. They told us that we had to turn off all the lights. And we were here about an hour ago, and things appeared to be winding down. This was a home that is associated with the suspect. Um, and earlier in the day, there were loud bangs heard from this home. Law enforcement told us that that was likely part of an FBI search and was standard procedure, not clear if they found anything. So we came to this location, but then everything, Lindsay, cleared out. All the vehicles uh, got in their line and they drove away. There were just a few officers that were essentially still staying in the property. And then suddenly, this whole column came back. And you can see some of those. It's still dark, but this street, this main road, is dotted with a number of law enforcement vehicles, including some heavily armored SWAT vehicles. And we were watching this play out, and it was, it was all slow and methodical and calm at first. But then we saw the officers raise some drones into the air. And again, we were trying to see in the darkness. And then we saw some shadows get out of the armored vehicles and a whole line of armed officers carrying long guns march off into the meadow. And we were like, well, wait a minute, what's going on? But there was very little information coming from law enforcement at the time. Now you can hear a helicopter is coming through as well. And so periodically we've seen the helicopters, we've heard the helicopters, there have been planes overhead, and we know we can still see, I don't know if you can see, probably not with this cell phone light, but there's at least one drone. There have been multiple drones that they've put up that have been circling the, pros uh, the property. But what's so remarkable about this, Lindsay, I mean, you and I have covered so many SWAT standoffs uh, over the years. Uh, many of them are high intensity, um, anxiety. Uh, things can like play out in a flash. Things can go wrong quickly. This is remarkably calm with what we're seeing so far. We haven't heard any bangs, any explosions uh, since those first ones were reported earlier today. All we've heard are the quiet commands of one officer on the megaphone calling out Robert Card by name, saying, we know you're in there. Come out with your hands up. We don't want anybody to get hurt. Asking him if anybody else is inside the home. Then it goes quiet, and then we hear these commands repeated again. And that's pretty much how it's played out. And we're just going to ask you to stand by for a moment. Of course, just give us a little tap to our producers that if you see any developments at all. For this moment right now, I do want to bring in uh, ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Brad Garrett. Brad, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, you've been hearing reporting from Whit Johnson outside of the home where police seem to be trying mm -hmm. to conduct an arrest. Uh, what's your impression from, from what you've witnessed so far? So the difference between what Witt apparently saw earlier, where they used flashbangs to go into locations, this sounds like they actually believe he is in there. And because of the type of weapon that he had at, in these shootings, and maybe he has other AR-15s or other weapons, the best thing to do is to try to talk him out initially. So what you do is in a stealthy fashion, you get into position. Then you get the hostage negotiators to start communicating with him. If Witt can actually hear him, hear them, I don't know if they're using a bullhorn, they're just talking through a door, whatever it might be. You have to have cover and concealment, obviously, to do that because you just don't know how he's going to react. But the key is to try to get him into a dialogue. Lindsay, the only way you can typically talk people out is to actually get them to talk to you. What, you know, what's going on? How are you feeling? Well, you know, et cetera. I haven't heard, obviously, Witt would know, any reaction from, uh, if it's Mr. Card inside, from him. But they're going to keep doing that for a period of time. At some point, 
they'll stop and they'll make a dynamic entry and go from there. The other thing they're doing, Lindsay, is figuring out ways to see inside the house. There are micro cameras you can run under doors. You can run through walls silently and see if you can figure out, A, where he is in the house, and B, does he have any weapons or weapons near him? Because that's going to be the real key. If you have that sort of intelligence and he won't come out, then you're going to go in and get him. At some point, they'll have to go in and get him anyway. But why risk officers getting hurt um, if you don't have to do that, if you can actually talk him out? So, so far, this is pretty textbook of, of how to do this, and I'm pretty impressed of, of how they're doing it. And, and you said at some point they would have to uh, make an entry. At, at what point do they decide, after they're trying to do this kind of one-way negotiation, if he doesn't respond, at what point do they decide that, that they need to go in? They're going to decide to go in once they feel like they have at least some intelligence. My sense would be before they even went to this house, they would have a schematic of it. Where are the rooms? Is there a basement? Are there closets you could go into? Is there an attic? Etc. So where conceivably is Mr. Card if he's in this house? Where is he? If you have that sort of information and through some techniques with cameras and mics, you might figure out where he is. And in Brad, the house, if I, I can just earlier. ask you, just to stand by just for a, a moment, Brad, because mm. we're going to come back to you, but do need to get back out on the scene for a moment with Whit Johnson. Uh, Whit just wanted to get an update on on what you're seeing and hearing. Well, Lindsay, in the past few minutes, uh, as you were speaking there, the the chopper has come back over and it started circling the scene, but the commands have stopped. We haven't heard any voices coming from the scene up there where you see those flashing lights. We do see a little bit of movement there. Um, but this is kind of how it's been. We've heard some commands. The only confirmation, uh, if you even want to call it that, that somebody is inside that property was the command from the officer himself who said, Robert Card, we know you're in there. Come out with your hands up, saying we don't want anybody to get hurt, giving him instructions to come near a vehicle. Um, and we heard that repeatedly, but so far, and Brad Garrett pointed this out, so far, at least from our vantage point, we have not heard any confirmation that somebody has responded from inside that home. So again, from what we can hear, I don't know, a couple hundred yards down the road, one-way commands from police officers into that property associated with the primary suspect. And, and so we know that you have the drones there, you have the chopper up ahead. On the ground, does it seem like it's surrounded? Are, are people actually, do you have the SWAT team members actually out of their vehicles and, and surrounding the home? Exactly. So, Lindsay, when they came up in their vehicles at first, we saw them. They sat in the vehicles for a while. They moved the media, the reporters, out of the street. They immediately told us we had to turn out our lights. Again, that's why we're speaking from a, a cell phone flashlight. Um, but then we could see the shadows of the doors opening on the armored vehicles, and we could see the SWAT officers getting out of those vehicles and quietly and slowly, methodically marching off into the fields. Um, and that was the last we saw them. They just sort of disappeared into the darkness of the horizon. Um, now, that would give us the sense, uh, to answer your question, that they were surrounding that property because we know the property is up the road, and it seemed like there was uh, as if they were trying to approach it uh, with those uh, SWAT officers from the left flank of the home. Again, it's hard to see in the dark, but clearly there were officers on foot, officer, officers in their vehicle, we can see the two drones. We can see the red and green lights of the two drones that have been circling overhead. And now, once again, the helicopter is back overseeing the property. It is interesting that we are no longer hearing those commands, at least at this point, that it seems like things have gone quiet by there. Uh, curious to get a sense of, like, how many squad cars, for example, are there? I know it's dark and difficult uh, for you to see, but just to kind of get uh, an, a sense of the police presence. 
I would say at least a dozen, if not more. Maybe I can check with our producers. Did you count how many vehicles? I know we were trying to count as the vehicles rolled up. Roughly a dozen vehicles that rolled up. And this was a mix mix of different type uh, of law enforcement vehicles. You can see the heavily armored SWAT uh, trucks that had the lights and you know and, and, and the big armor on them and all the officers inside. Um, and then regular squad cars. We also saw some larger vehicles that clearly were, were used um, as part of the equipment that was used for this kind of search. Um, so truly a variety. And the interesting thing is throughout the day here, Lindsay, we've gone to, we've followed some of these vehicles to, to different properties. Um, there was another home associated, excuse me, I'm just listening for a second. There was another home associated with this suspect uh, where we were earlier today. And again, there was an armed presence of law enforcement officers there. Uh, and that's where we were getting ready to go live before we heard the reports of the explosions happening at this house. But, Lindsay, this is really just an intense and dramatic turn of events um, because it really seemed for a moment there that whatever was happening here was over. Um, police packed up and the vehicles left and everything went quiet except for a few cars down the road. And then suddenly they all came back and it started all over again. Um, but it's important to point out, and I really, I, I like the question that Brad Garrett posed is, you know, have we heard a response from the suspect? Again, from our vantage point, there's no confirmation that there is someone inside that home other than the one-way conversation that we've heard from the, the law enforcement officers. And just, we're going to let you go, Whip, but just one last question. Just give us a sense of the time frame, because you said that everything had gone quiet. It seemed that the police cars had gone away and then all of a sudden uh, returned. Uh, so about what, how, how much time have they been there in, in the negotiation process? I would say that they've been here. I'm just looking at my clock right now. I'd say that it was about the last 40 minutes that they've been here. It was like 7 o'clock right before we were ready to come on the air with you, Lindsay, when suddenly this whole line of vehicles came back. But again, in the beginning, we were just curious about it. Like, well, why'd they come back? Uh, they weren't, you know, rushing with the, with the flashing lights and blaring horns. They just calmly drove up the road in a line, got out of the car, and circled the home. So it, you know, it went from like zero to 60 in a second. And that's when we started hearing the commands. And when you took your earpiece out a moment ago, were you hearing another command or no? It's difficult because the helicopter overhead, but let me just double check here with the producers. You guys haven't heard any new commands in the past couple of minutes, have you? About 10 minutes. For 10 minutes. It's been silent for 10 minutes. We've sort of been timing this out. Um, not only has it been silent, but we haven't actually seen a whole lot of movement. But again, from our vantage point, there is sort of like a, a mist or a fog in the air above the grass. And you can see the red and blue lights that are illuminating that mist. Um, and every now and then you see kind of something happening in the background, but it's not clear exactly what's going on in front of the home. Just riveting to watch this unfold minute by minute with you, Wit. Uh, if you can stand by for us, we do want to bring in Pierre Thomas. And, and Pierre, give us a sense of what you're hearing from your sources about now this aspect of, of the investigation. Well, one of the things we're checking with sources to try to get a definitive answer is whether they think he's actually in there. Clearly, there's a possibility that he's in there, but I can tell you in a situation like this where the suspect is believed to be so heavily armed and so dangerous, they're just not going to take any chances. So, for example, if a curtain moved, and, and they probably had someone monitoring this house, you know, looking at the house, if anything moved in the house, if they have any reason to believe that anyone's in the house, they would issue these commands. They would do these, the very things that you're seeing uh, unfold. But we don't yet have confirmation that they know for certain that he's inside, but they're certainly treating it as such. It, for some reason, though, they do believe, and maybe it's thermal imaging, we really don't know. It would all be conjecture at this point on our part. But uh, it, it, shy of him coming out, how long could we see a standoff at this point? Well, again, they have technology uh, that they can use to see if there's movement inside of a dwelling. Um, they will be able to determine that at some point, depending on whether the suspect is sophisticated enough to know how to mask a heat signature, uh, that's all at play here as well. Um, again, they're going to be careful 
but they are also going to make sure that no one can exit that house without them knowing. Uh, again, just given the nature of how brutal this suspect is thought to have acted within those lo locations uh, in Maine, they simply are not going to take any chances. And again, whether they know he's in there for certain or not, if there's any hint that he might be there, they are going to do everything you see them doing right now, Lindsay. And of course, this particular area has been, uh, was added uh, to the area of lockdown uh, for uh, homeowners in this part uh, of Maine. Give us a sense of, of the mindset uh, of law enforcement as they're just in this waiting game at this point. Well, the mindset is you have an unstable person who's clearly very proficient with you know, assault style rifles and who's willing to use it. Also, if you factor in uh, the information they have that they're working off of, that he was hearing voices, had discussed threatening or shooting other soldiers. This is a person that would be on the extreme scale of potential danger to law enforcement and anyone else around him. That is why you have the lockdown. That is why they told anyone who would encounter this person, do not move near them, attempt to speak with him at all. So uh, I can tell you, I've been covering this a long time. Uh, there is antsy and as concerned about this suspect as anyone in recent memory. Pierre Thomas for us. Pierre, would like you to stand by as well and now bring back in uh, former FBI agent Brad Garrett. Uh, Brad, uh, give us a sense, now that we've heard from WIT, uh, that it seems like police have, have stopped uh, communicating. Uh, what's your impression of that? So that's fairly common. If somebody is not answering you, you pause. And during a pause, they may sense through drones or through some other activity, through cameras that they may have gotten into the house, uh, movement. Because it also can set a suspect, at, uh, make him more uneasy, like, why did you stop talking to me? Despite the fact that he's not talking to them. But to go back to something to sort of tail into what Pierre said, they'll go into that house at some point. It might be in 10 minutes and it might be in two hours, but they're gonna go into that house once they feel like they have enough intelligence to sufficiently protect their officers. You know, knowing that when you do this, when you make dynamic entries, that it's just there's a hidden risk in doing it for obvious reasons. But they're gonna go in that house at some point. It's like, when do they feel comfortable enough? And, you know, maybe he's not there. They certainly are acting like he might well be there because I'm not convinced you would wait this long if, in fact, you were to sort of iffy about whether he's in there or not. So it suggests to me, Lindsay, is that they got some intelligence that maybe saw him go in the house or a camera caught him. And we would imagine that they are using thermal imaging as well, right? We're going to go back to you in a moment, Brad, but want to bring Wit back in there. Wit, it looks like we see some movement of at least a, perhaps one or more police vehicles toward the house. Yes, Lindsay, we've been watching this. It was very calm for a period of time. And then just a moment ago, I, I, it's hard to see from here in the dark, but it appears that the armored vehicle that we saw earlier then started driving towards the property. It also appears as if they illuminated the property some more. There are more lights on it right now, helicopter flying overhead. And in fact, there is a drone that they're flying really low on the opposite side. So it appears as if they're moving in closer, trying to get a better look of what's happening. So there is some movement. We see some shadows. We haven't heard any more of those commands that we were hearing earlier. I'm just listening for a second because there's some light peering through the trees. The chopper makes it a little bit difficult to hear, but we're definitely seeing movement near the property. It and looks again, like we're seeing uh, those are drones, right? Oh, that we're seeing Sorry. is that right? The the red the red lights that we're seeing looking just above maybe uh, right along the roof line those are drones correct exactly yeah so the drones are easy hang on a second it looks as though a vehicle is backing out yes those red the red and green lights were little drones that were flying right around the top of the property now the vehicle is backing out i don't know if you can see that in your shot the flashing blue lights is backing away from the property we now have a little bit more light 
that is being cast into the driveway from that vehicle. And it's not clear what's happening now. Another light. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. But these are not just squad cars at this point. I mean, it looks like there are some heavy duty tactical vehicles now, per perhaps one that's driving in. Uh, you can tell us better from, from your vantage point what you're seeing. Exactly. These were a couple of the what appear to be armored vehicles that came uh, up the road towards the front. Some of these vehicles uh, are, are the ones that we saw the SWAT officers, um, you know, in, heavy, in body armor, essentially get out of those vehicles and then go out into the field on foot. Um, but yes, we've seen two vehicles now sort of backing in and out of what appears to be a driveway. Um, and, and you're right, again, those, those red and green lights that you were seeing kind of moving around off in the distance, um, that was at least one of the drones. Um, but now, you know, the helicopter coming around again, too. Um, but it's been quiet. It's been quiet. We haven't, we've been trying to listen carefully, trying to hear if there are any more commands, any, any flashbangs, anything like that. Wait, hang on one sec. It, it's really tough with the chopper now that even if there is a sound, it's hard to, it's hard to make out what they could be saying. But now that vehicle is sort of staying we put. And wait, I was just going to interrupt to say that we are just hearing uh, that we've gotten confirmation that the letter uh, that the FBI found inside the home was apparently a letter written from Mr. Card to his son, a suicide note. Uh, and so it, it seems that, uh, you know, perhaps there is some additional uh, information, obviously, that law enforcement is collecting in real time and starting to reveal uh, to the public. Uh, we know that there was a shelter in place order given for this particular area. Are you seeing any activity in, in the surrounding homes? And, and uh, you know, does it seem like the, the neighbors, for example, are adhering to that and, and staying safe inside their homes? For the most part, people have been adhering to those lockdown orders. Um, we've seen a few people coming out of their homes, mostly staying you know, on their front porch, checking things out to see what's going on. But businesses have been shuttered in multiple cities, schools closed, the downtown areas appear like ghost towns. We've had trouble finding places to eat and go to the bathroom in town. There's no food available. Um, so the town has very much been on lockdown in a way that, you know, again, I've, covered multiple standoffs and manhunts, but haven't quite experienced something like this. And because this area is so rural and heavily wooded, it, it almost, as you're driving around these communities, you, you ask yourself, how is it possible that they could even find somebody out here? Um, and we've seen law enforcement move from one area, from Lewiston, then to Lisbon, where they found his vehicle, and now we're in Bowdoin, where these two properties are that are uh, associated, believed to be associated uh, with the prime suspect. <clears throat> but, Lindsay, we have to remind ourselves, this is a community that has been gripped by fear. They just experienced this awful tragedy, this tight-knit community. Eighteen people, at least, were killed. Children witnessed this horror inside a bowling alley. And they haven't even had time to grieve because they're on lockdown and hiding out inside their homes because this killer is still out there. So... But this has been the most intense development that we've seen <coughs> in the past 24 hours. <coughs> As you say, with grief coupled with fear, uh, and I do <coughs> want to just report uh, some of the more information that we're getting in with regard to that suicide note that was addressed to Robert Card's son. Uh, sources said that the note does not provide information that indicates a motive for the mass shooting, <coughs> but rather contains what sources describe as rantings, as well as basic personal information like bank account details, and Wit will come back to you in a moment, but when, want to bring back in uh, Brad Garrett. Uh, Brad, we saw those tactical vehicles going in, one went into the driveway, then reversed out, and then another one came up to the house. Any idea uh, of what we could be witnessing with that? Yes. You try to change the atmosphere around a building, or in, in this case, a house, with some regularity. 
You're trying to keep a suspect disrupted to a certain extent that will cause them to move uh, or even possibly, but not less likely, he's going to come out. But the key is get him to move because if he moves, you may well pick up some additional information. Uh, it doesn't surprise me they've lit up the house. Now they may be less lit up the house. Uh, and you may see some variations as this goes on. You know, an interesting thing, playing off what Aaron Katursky has come up with in reference to suicide, which is always a factor in mass shooters in some form or fashion, is maybe he is deceased inside this house. Uh, and, and law enforcement's not sure if that's true, and they're not going to take any chances. But as I said earlier, at some point, they're going to go in this house, and, and we'll see. But that's the disruption that you're sort of witnessing is actually fairly common. It's a common technique. And, and I was curious about that, Brad, with regard to knowing now that that was a suicide note addressed to uh, his son. If there is a body inside, would we get be able to get it based on the thermal technology or whatever um, you know um, apparatuses they have available to them? Uh, would they be able to tell if that person is is dead or alive? Well, I mean, think about thermal I imaging. I'm not sure that law enforcement has the capacity to look in through a house. You know, thermal in imagery is used in woods and open areas. In other words, things moving on the ground that you can actually uh, find the, the thermal print, if you will. So I don't know how much, I wouldn't rely a lot on that. I would rely more on, uh, and you know, obviously you and I don't know the answer to this, nor does Wit, as to what brought them back to that house, because some piece of intel uh, brought them back to that house and to invest the type of, uh, of time and energy they're putting into deciding when they do go into this house ultimately. And the suspect's Army Reserve Command was so alarmed uh, by his behavior that they actually hospitalized him for psychological evaluation. Are there any mechanisms in the military that could have prevented him uh, from getting his hands on a gun? I don't think so because the military obviously doesn't control, they control what weapons a, a person on active duty or in their jurisdiction can have or, or can't have, but they don't really have any control what goes on in the in, in the in the community where you know enlisted people and officers would live. That's going to be driven by state laws. Bring it on the basis of a different story, of course. So the question that was asked earlier, Lindsay, is whatever happened uh, last summer at West Point. It, it, did that ever get relay, relayed to uh, law enforcement? Now, even if it had been, it just depends on what it is. Mental health stuff becomes really sort of squishy when it comes to what law enforcement can do with it. People big time disturbed. This guy probably fits that category in some form or fashion. You know, doesn't get you to, we're going to watch you 24 hours a day because we're concerned about you launching some sort of attack. Law enforcement is driven by specificity, that they have specific information. Let's go back and rewind two days ago. And they had information that Mr. Card was going to go someplace in, uh, and, sh and shoot up one or two places. They obviously would have stopped him before that occurred. But they didn't know that. Uh, it's that kind of information that law enforcement works on. Law enforcement is not equipped to follow people or keep track of people that are potentially violent. They kind of have to know they're about to become violent. And that's a, you know, that's a high bar. And it also, there's only so many officers, detectives, agents in this country. You just can't keep track of versions of Mr. Card day in and day out. Although we probably should do a much better job of that. And Brad, do you want to ask you about uh, some new intelligence that we're learning from our correspondent, uh, Aaron Katursky, who's saying that law enforcement is now saying they don't know if the suspect is, in fact, inside the home. So uh, just wanted to, to circle back to the idea of why they might have gone back to this home, why they would go through uh, this painstaking time of, of trying to give these commands and, and try to tell him that he's under arrest and try to get him to come out. If they 
really weren't sure. What, what kinds of things would lead them to, to go back to this home? Because they have a piece of intelligence through a relative, through a phone call, through something that increased the, the likelihood, and I don't know what percentage you want to place on that, that he might be in there. Uh, I will tell you, I've talked through doors for hours when nobody was on the other side. We thought they were on the other side, mm. but they weren't. So I think you may have something like that here, like maybe the officers are not really convinced, but there's intel that would suggest he might well be in there. Uh, and that's why they're sort of doing this waiting game. But as I've said more than once tonight, that's going to end here at some point. And let's talk about that note that uh, they found inside of the home. How significant is that, that suicide note addressed to his son? Well, if you look at mass shootings in general, they're suicide missions. I mean, most mass shooters either die at the, the, at the scene either by forcing law enforcement to kill them or they shoot themselves or they shoot themselves a short distance away. Few exceptions. Parkland is, a, is an exception. Nicholas Cruz obviously walked off and got caught blocks away or a short distance away from the school. But by and large, they, when they set out to do these things, they are pretty much convinced they're not going to live through them or they don't want to live through them. So the, the fact that Mr. Card apparently has written a suicide note to his son, it really doesn't surprise me. And as we have gone since this shooting occurred, it, it struck me that they may well have been chasing a dead person, you know, moments after he disappeared from his vehicle. Uh, but we'll see how that plays out. And I just one more before we'd like you to just stand by. Uh, I know you said you're not surprised about the suicide note, but are you surprised then that there would be potentially this setup if it was him that drove his vehicle to the, the location that had a boat potentially on the water? I mean, it seems like a, a quite an advanced uh, escape plan to, to then potentially die by suicide. But we also are making assumptions here, right? We don't know that any of that occurred. It does make logical sense that he drives and then sort of disappears at that point. He could have had another car parked there. He could have walked to a different location. Uh, it's really hard to say. But, you know, I even went through this thought press earlier once we learned about water, or boat ramp, et cetera. I mean, did he have some sort of getaway plan? But the suicide note, assuming it's legitimate, sort of counters that that he knew that this was going to end in his death and probably at his own hand. All right, Brad Garrett, we always appreciate your insight. If you could stand by for us, I'd like to bring in ABC News law enforcement contributor Jared Bergwan. Uh, he was police chief in San Bernardino, California in 2015 when a mass shooter killed 14 people at a holiday party. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'd like to just start out by getting your impression from the police activity we're seeing right now. Well, it is certainly uh, it certainly is interesting. It's an interesting turn of events, and and obviously, uh, you know, we are very much riveted to uh, to the hopes uh, that they have the suspect and that they've got him contained, and that hopefully this is going to come to an end soon. Uh, there are a couple things from a tactical standpoint that come to mind. Uh, one is uh, what was described as the team being there, it being relatively low key. Then it appeared that they were leaving and then they quietly went back. Uh, that could very well have been a tactic. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we've had many incidents over the years where officers have been searching for somebody and they're not finding them and they've gone yard to yard, house to house, whatever it might be. Uh, and finally, you know, most officers will leave and one or two officers will stick around just to watch. And then sure enough, the suspect appears, uh, you know, once he thinks all the officers are gone. It could have been a tactic such as that. Uh, it could have been, uh, very well that they left. They thought he wasn't there, and then maybe there was some indication that he was. Uh, the fact that uh, there are some things that concern me. One is if they really truly believe he was there, uh, most of the time, unless law enforcement's got an incredibly disciplined approach, uh, my guess is you're going to see more folks arriving uh, more and more often. 
uh, and, and they're not saying and they're not reporting that. So that, that concerns me that they're going through some uh, bit of an exercise here just to make sure that he's not there. You're right, because again, there is no confirmation that he is inside the house. Uh, some of those announcements Whit heard are, are due diligence. Uh, tell us about that process, executing search warrants in, in these kinds of cases. Well, the, you know, obviously there's an enormous amount of intel that's gone on uh, or, or gone into looking into who Robert Cart is, every single house that he might have a connection to, family residences, cabins, friends, associates, everything that you, you can imagine. Uh, rest assured, the investigators have, have, have kicked over every stone in their endeavor to learn everything they can about him. Uh, and the search teams that are actively looking for him are going to follow up at each and every one of those places. And that is in addition to following up on tips and telephone calls that they're getting. And that is in addition to the natural search that would take place uh, from where they last saw his car and the last place that he may have been there, whether it's through the use of dogs or searching the woods or whatever it might be. It is a painstaking step by step by step process that will continue until they have exhausted every single lead, every single uh, bit of information that they have, or until the trail goes completely cold. Uh, but it will continue. From a tactical standpoint, uh, you know, the search warrants, you got to remember in something like this, the suspect has, in many cases, if he is there, if he's hiding in the woods, if he's hiding in an environment that he's familiar with, he has all the advantage of the world in the world. He has the ability to uh, to have scoped it out initially, to have set aside hiding spots, to have positioned himself in a, in a way that he can see anybody that's coming. Uh, he has the capacity to know the area. He has the capacity to have created hiding spots that in some cases could be next to impossible for law enforcement to find on foot. Um, he's got all the advantages. What is important to remember is that as it takes place, law enforcement still has time on their side. If he is in fact at this house, there is no reason for law enforcement to be in a hurry. There is no reason for those teams to rush in and unnecessarily endanger the lives of officers. That urgency doesn't come into play until you know that he poses an immediate threat to somebody else, uh, to an innocent person. Uh, at that, other than that, law enforcement has all the time in the world to, uh, and this thing could go on for days if they wanted to. All the time in the world before I let you go, just want to get a sense of at what point, though, would they decide to, to breach the house, to go inside? So you're going to have a tactical commander. Somebody's going to be in charge of that scene, uh, and somebody's going to have the authority to ultimately make the decisions. They have their protocols. They have their trigger points of when entry teams are going to make a dynamic entry if something uh, unexpected starts to take place or there is some immediate threat to somebody or something that says they have to breach immediately. Those plans are already in place. The officers are there, know what their role is, and they know when they're going to have to move. Outside of that, if they decide that this has gone on long enough and we are now going to do a planned breach, it will be a very, very coordinated, uh, very, very dynamic entry. Uh, probably for multiple fronts, but it will be made by the commanders on scene and they will determine when that time comes. Thank you so much. Again, like to ask you to stand by as well as we bring in our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Kontursky. Aaron, I know your sources are giving you some information about that possible suicide note by the shooter. Uh, what can you tell us? The authorities found a note in one of the locations associated with the mass shooting suspect, Robert Card, Lindsay. And at first, they declined to describe it or describe its significance. But sources familiar with the note and the investigation are now telling ABC News it is a suicide note addressed to Robert Card's son. Uh, it does not, we're told, contain information that might point to a motive for why the mass shootings in Lewiston occurred but rather uh, does include some rantings. Uh, those were not further described to us. Uh, and, and some rather mundane information like bank account numbers and, and things perhaps that uh, Robert Card's son could find useful should his father not be there. So the, the suicide note is just one clue that the authorities are, are now looking at as they try to develop a bigger picture uh, of what he was all about. And Aaron, we know our team is also getting uh, more reporting about the suspect's behavior online. Uh, tell us what you know about that. 
one of the other things law enforcement authorities are learning about uh, some of what he was engaging with in his online life. That includes a lot of what's been described to us as conspiratorial content, uh, engaging with some conspiracy theories involving everything from gun rights and gay rights to commentary about public officials, including President Biden. Again, it helps fill out the picture of who the suspect is, but does not appear to necessarily give a motive for uh, why these mass shootings occurred. The biggest clues in that regard have come from the family, which has been cooperative, we're told, with law enforcement authorities. Lindsay, the sister of the suspect told the authorities that when she first heard about the shooting and the initial location at the bowling alley, she thought that her brother may have been going after an ex-girlfriend. So one possibility here that authorities are trying to investigate is whether this mass shooting somehow initiated through a, a, a domestic dispute. We continue to see, um, it looks like some officers coming outside, crouching on the ground perhaps there with the, the tactical units uh, on that screen. Aaron Katursky, we thank you as always for your reporting and, and do want you to stand by as we now bring in Richard Frankel, former special agent at the FBI, uh, who was a hostage negotiator. Uh, Richard, you, just give us a sense of, of your thoughts as, as we're watching the situation unfold. So, you know, what they're doing right now is it is exactly what they should be doing if they either know he's in there or they don't know he's in there. It's going to be the same approach because, as, uh, as was previously stated, um, you know, time is now on the side of the investigators at this scene. Um, there's no need to rush in at this scene. I'm sure they're doing other things at other scenes. They're still looking for him because it's unconfirmed that we have the subject in this house. But at the scene, at the house, they're gonna take their time. They're gonna to continue to act as if he's in there, even if they don't know. So you, you probably have a hostage negotiator um, who is the one who you've heard uh, call into the house and will continue to have a conversation with whomever is in the house, if there is anyone. It's gonna be one-sided, but it's gonna be something that you have to do because if, there is somebody there. You want that person to know that law enforcement is out there, they're not going away, and the only way for this to end peacefully is for you to talk to this person. You know, um, I've been on other uh, hostage negotiation matters where we did this for uh, uh, about an hour and a half. And, you know, it got to the point where everyone was like, you know, I, I, it's almost time for us to go. And then they saw a shadow underneath the door and they knew that the subject was in there. So again, time is on the side. Let the negotiators do their job. Let the technical guys do their job with, you know, the, you know, the, um, uh, the fleers and the, and the drones and all the other things. Um, let the investigators do their job because they're still trying to determine whether he's in there or whether he could be somewhere else. So everyone's doing exactly what they should be doing now. When a shooter is expected to be this dangerous, how much caution do authorities have to use? Oh, it's extreme caution because we've already learned that he is a dangerous individual because he killed 20 people, but they also have in information that he may have been a firearms instructor and tactically trained. And because of that, now he's not just armed and dangerous, he's armed, dangerous, and actually you know, like effective, or he's he he's a he is a true um, uh, uh, gun aficionado who knows how to use those weapons. So when you approach that person, you want a, a, a team that is it has trained for that and is ready to deal with somebody uh, who is this armed and dangerous. So you're going to want a SWAT team. You're going to want one of the tactical teams from uh, you know uh, uh, one of the other federal agencies, HRT may be on the scene and which is a hostage rescue team out of Quantico, Virginia. And you know, they are trained in these specific types of engagements where you have a uh, uh, where you have a bad guy who knows how to use weapons, has used them and is not afraid to use them again. So while it's dangerous, at least we have the right teams engaging with this subject if he is in fact in the house.
Uh, of course, we've been following this minute by minute from the first developments here. How long might we expect a situation like this to last? You know, uh, as, as uh, we, we've stated, you know, other, other people before me have stated, um, you know, time at this location is on our side, meaning it's on the government side, it's on law enforcement side. There's no reason to, to rush in. Um, so at this point, take your time. Do everything that you need to do to see if he is in fact in there. And if you have an indication he's in there, then this could go on for days. Um, if you have no indication, then sooner or later, you're going to have both the tactical um, uh, um, commander, you'll have the negotiator, and you have the on-scene commander, who actually has responsibility for everything, have a meeting and discuss when it is time to go inside. But again, you only want to go inside if you've exhausted everything you can to determine whether he is inside and also you want to go in there as safe efficient and effective as possible to make sure that no law enforcement uh, uh officer is endangered to um uh, uh just um, beyond a reasonable amount and lastly, uh, before we let you go, obviously there still is very much a presence there, uh, but we have seen some of the tactical vehicles start to drive away. Uh, what does that tell you? Well, it, it could be a couple of different things. First, they may be deciding, okay, we've got the right amount of people here. We don't need this many people for this, um, uh, for this assignment. Um, and let, let's have the negotiator uh, do his job. They may have another place to go. They may have had another indication that this subject is at a is at a different location, and therefore they need to split the uh, tactical teams up, have one stay here and one go to the other location, and then it could just be um, you know uh, strategy and tactics of how the uh, the um, uh, on scene commander wants to use his people. All right, Mr. Frankel, we thank you so much again for all of your insight and want to bring back in Mr. Burguan. What does that tell you? The fact that, again, still a police presence, but it, it seems like the, the number of, of vehicles there uh, are slowly diminishing. Yeah, you know, my experience is that if they really believe that he is actually there or they have a degree of confidence or certainty that he is there, Resources are not going to leave until he is either confirmed deceased or he is in handcuffs. So something tells me that if people are actively leaving and that scene is remaining relatively quiet, uh, the priority or the, uh, uh, the level of commitment to that location is probably winding down. Now, we don't know that. It could very well be part of a tactic. Uh, but, but my experience is somebody that's wanted as much as he is, if there's some folks that are starting to leave, it's either already resolved or uh, or they have other priorities. And when you say part of a tactic, and again, we're just speculating here, but potentially to, to try to potentially make the person inside believe that, oh, they're leaving, I can breathe a little easier at this point. Yeah, yeah that, that is a tactic that is that is used from time to time. Keep in mind too, that there's a lot of technology available to these teams uh, that are working that. So we know that the helicopter came in for a period of time. Helicopters have some pretty advanced FLIR systems on them that are very, very good at picking up heat signatures in and around and on the ground. Um, I don't know if that helicopter is still circling overhead. Uh, in addition to that, we've heard about the drones. Uh, the drones too can have that type of technology. So aside from the cameras, they have the ability to detect heat signatures. Uh, SWAT teams on the ground have the capacity to deploy robots that can move through a variety of terrains uh, those robots also have FLIR technology along with camera technology, and it's a safe way to approach an area. So if that was a possibility, that's a way to do it. Robots can even go uh, into areas of a home and breach rooms and do things like that. So they've got a lot of technology on their side that could minimize the risk to, uh, you know, to actual police officers. Uh, and I'm sure they're deploying all of that in this case. Obviously, for the people on the ground and in this community, they are eager to get some semblance of closure here. I'm curious, having lived through similar situations like this before personally, it, what's going through your head today as, as you watch these horrific events unfold here in Lewiston? Well, we had one of those situations in 2015 where the suspects escaped as well. 
Um, I will say fortunately, uh, in our particular case, it took about three and a half to four hours to track them down. And then in a, you know, in a fairly dramatic, uh, you know, fashion, there was a shootout with law enforcement and the suspects were killed. Uh, so during the height of the attention, uh, the height of the anxiety, it came to some degree of resolution and that brought, uh, you know, that brought tensions down considerably. However, in that period of time from the event itself until the suspects were actually caught, the tension is immense. The pressure is immense. And the reality is, unless you have a great deal of certainty as to where those suspects were, and we didn't have it until near the very end of our incident, your mind is going everywhere with the possibility of where they could be. And I can I can share with you that personal experience being in Southern California. Uh, you know, we had theories that maybe the suspects were fleeing to the border. Maybe there were secondary locations. There were other things that could potentially be threats. Things were locking down, much as we're seeing in, in, in Maine, where they're shutting down cities, they're shutting down schools, they're shutting down offices. Those very same things were happening in our city. What we found afterwards by putting the investigation together is that in our case, the suspects were actually on the move the entire time, and in many cases had come close to us. The point is, the tension is immense until you can resolve it. Well, of course, we're going to like to bring you back in if we can ask you to stick around as we continue to watch this unfold. Uh, for the moment, I want to bring in Chris Brown, president of Brady, the country's oldest organization dedicated to gun violence prevention. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to pose the same question to you, just getting your reaction to, to seeing this latest act of gun violence in our country. Well, it, it never gets easier. I mean, it's horrific to think about families spending time together at a bowling alley, enjoying time together at a restaurant, living life, and then suddenly having everything change. You know, I'm thinking about uh, the father and son, uh, Bill and Aaron Young. Aaron was only 14 years old, enjoying an evening or afternoon at the bowling alley, and now they're no longer with us. And it uh, fills me with despair. Our families, America's children, don't have to live this way and certainly don't have to die this way. Your organization advocates for the banning of assault weapons, and it does appear that this shooter was using one last night. I want to play for you a moment from a press conference from earlier today with Democratic Congressman Jared Golden of Maine seeming to change his position. Let's take a listen. I have opposed efforts to ban deadly weapons of war like the assault rifle used to carry out this crime. The time has now come for me to take responsibility for this failure, which is why I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles like the one used by the sick perpetrator of this mass killing. He is a Marine Corps veteran and one of the most conservative Democrats in the House. How significant is that change? I hope it's very significant. I was watching that press conference in real time. You expect uh, too often in today's world that individuals who are in those situations who have not supported any reasonable gun control measures, which is unfortunately the history of Representative Golden, that they can sometimes double down on that. We saw that far too often with politicians representing constituents in Parkland, et cetera. And I was music to my ears, and Brady is ready, willing, and able to do whatever we can to support Representative Golden and a huge number of additional members in Congress who want to enact an assault weapons ban, which is a universally supported policy initiative. Even a majority of gun owners want this to happen. I, I just hope that Representative Golden can also understand that there are a number of additional laws that also need to be put into effect at the federal level, expanding the Brady background check system being among them so that Mainers can truly be protected and that all of our citizens across this country can actually feel safer. That's what he said. The illusion of safety was something I felt and now I realize that I need to do something to enhance our policy, to protect our citizens. That's how every elected official should feel. We know no one is immune to this. All of us as Americans deserve to live, exist in safe communities. And that means communities free from gun violence. 
No one is immune, as you say, and, and people here were just carrying out their ordinary activities on, on a Wednesday night, an otherwise ordinary Wednesday. As you know, there has been no success on legislation to ban these types of weapons, no matter how many times we see a repeat of these kinds of massacres taking place in our country. Do you think that there's anything that might ultimately change that? Well, look, it, there has been some success. We did get the assault weapons ban the very year after the Brady Law was enacted. Of course, that was in 1994. It was a 10-year sunset. We look back and we know that that law worked, that uh, mass shootings materially decreased during that time. Yes, there has not been the movement at the federal level that we need. We need uniform laws. But a number of states, now eight states in the District of Columbia, have acted on their own to ban assault-style weapons and high-capacity magazines in many states. And those states have, that have done that have seen decreased gun violence in their state. We need a uniform standard, though, especially when it comes to assault weapons. And I think, frankly, Representative Golden, who has not been historically a champion, raising his voice, committing to really take to the House floor and talk about why this is necessary as someone who himself is uh, a veteran. We need more gun owners to lift up their voices and demand that this happen. And we're seeing that more and more and more. But all of us as Americans, especially those who own firearms, who have enough, please raise your voice. Join Brady in calling for a renewal of the assault weapons ban. We need you. We've seen a lot of discussion today about the shooter's mental health history, uh, but I want to share a post from you on X, formerly Twitter, today saying this. Uh, the idea that mental health is at the root of gun violence is an ableist lie designed to deflect responsibility from the gun industry. Call it out wherever you see it. I explain your position there. Look, I mean, it's sort of like when you look at uh, folks talking about Maine's yellow flag law. That's not a law that really has done anything to remove guns from individuals who are exhibiting behaviors that indicate that they are at risk. Many of those individuals may or may not have a diagnosable mental illness. The United States doesn't have any more mental illness than any other country in the world. We have a lot more gun violence. Why is that? Because we have 450 million firearms and we're not doing enough to ensure that the systems we have to protect ourselves and to take guns away from individuals exhibiting behaviors that they are at risk actually work. That's where we need to focus our attention. The fact of the matter is, if you have a diagnosed mental illness in this country, the risk to you that you will be the victim of gun violence is significantly higher than you will perpetrate gun violence. That's what that tweet was about. That's what that X tweet was about. And we really want to mm -hmm. take away the bogeyman that this is about mentally ill people having easy access to guns. It's about people who are at risk having too, too easy access to guns. And let's focus on those kinds of behaviors and enact actual strong red flag laws, which Maine does not have. If it did, things might be different so that when we see these behaviors and we understand that there's a potential risk, we can take action effectively to address that risk and remove firearms when necessary from individuals who pose a risk. And we should note this is still an active manhunt. Uh, we have shown images of the suspected shooter as law enforcement agencies are working around the clock trying to track him down. Uh, you're a supporter of the notion of no notoriety for mass shooters to avoid giving them any um, additional fame or attention. Uh, why do you think that's so critical? Well, actually, that campaign was started by parents who lost uh, children in a mass shooting. Copycat issues are very real. Look, I mean, you've had a lot of experts talking about the psychology behind this and the likelihood given uh, that, that uh, a shooter might have his or her name, and usually his name repeated in the media, that others will be, quote unquote, inspired to take similar action. You take that risk away, you de-risk it significantly when you give no notoriety to this individual. It's actually studied. Sociologists have look at, looked at it. It's very, very important not to 
uh, spur copycats and not to give these individuals any uh, sense of glory over what happened with this carnage. So it's it's quite important, the notoriety campaign, and Brady has long supported it. We thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I'd like to bring in ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Brad Garrett. Brad, uh, thanks again for, for coming back and, and joining us once again. Uh, clearly, the shooter was battling mental health issues as we learn more about the suicide note and his online activity. What kind of insight does that give you? So people, and I'm generalizing here, people who tend to have these very confused sort of extreme ways of thinking that probably play into uh, this, some textbook stuff, uh, delusions and paranoia. And based on, without knowing his rantings, what little we've heard, it sort of fits into that category to a certain extent. The reason I'm telling you that, Lindsay, is, you know, delusions are false belief systems. And so whatever he believes in his head is real to him. It's not real to the rest of us. Uh, but that's what's driving him. And that if he's in that house and he is alive, if you can get him to talk to you, you really have to go to what is going on with this delusion. You actually have to talk to him like you are buying his delusion to get him to at least connect with you temporarily. So I'm, I'm, that, that's one possibility here, but it makes it very difficult sometimes to sort of figure out what people like him will do. Um, and that's why I think the, the greater likelihood of him being not alive at this point is reasonable. We've learned that the shooter's family has been cooperative, uh, offering information to investigators. How important is that for, for the people who are trying to learn more about the shooter? Well, it's extremely important. I mean, some of the early interviews you, you would actually do in this case, once he was identified, is immediately go to parents, brothers, sisters, boyfriends, girlfriends, people they work with, people who have spent time with them and maybe had witnessed some deterioration in him in recent times, because that tends to happen with these folks. Um, and all of that becomes helpful in understanding his way of thinking. And it may also give you some insight as to places he might actually be. Uh, so more information from people who know the person. If he's being treated by a mental health professional based on what he's done, I realize there's all these privacy laws you might even get some insight there that could help you. But the key is know as much as you can about him because it's going to help you ultimately in, either in getting him out of a house or if you get him into custody, everything I'm saying becomes extremely important when you sit down to interview him. The suspect's Army Reserve Command was so alarmed by his behavior that they actually had him hospitalized for psychological evaluation. We heard from Senator Collins mm -hmm. uh, earlier today saying that based on the yellow flag laws, he should not have been able to get his hands on a gun. Was that a failure here? Well, you know, the yellow flag, unlike the red flag law, is is fairly cumbersome of all of the extensive investigation you have to in, to conduct and again we don't know obviously the specifics of what happened in the summer the military were obviously concerned enough they took him to a hospital but you know was he demonstrating was he saying violent things was he saying that he was going to go harm someone or take a weapon and do something violent we don't know. I assume if he did that, that they would have passed that information on to somebody. But, um, you know, this is a guy that's it's been hurting for a long time for we don't know for what reasons. Um, and they have exacerbated in recent weeks for, again, we don't know why. And that's what's sort of built up. And that's what happens, particularly in shooters that have you know, a severe mental health overlay. A lot of these shooters have problems, but maybe not to the degree it appears that Mr. Card may have. And uh, it, it's, it, 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 you know, it's, the system is not, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is the system is not really designed to deal with people like him. If it's not, and I said this earlier, if it's not specific about a threat, 
They tend to treat it, you know, as a, as a mental health disorder, which it obviously is, but there's no mechanism to keep track of where he is and what he's doing, or in this case, what weapons he might have. So he, I understand why the, why the senator said something about yellow flag. I'm not sure it would have worked because of the cumbersome nature and the extent of the investigation you have to conduct to actually do something as far as seizing somebody's weapons. Uh, we've talked about the suicide note. We've talked about the family uh, offering their uh, any information that they can to investigators. Um, at what point um, do we now move on? Where uh, investigators, what are they looking for now to, to try to, to finish, um, I guess, completing the circle here of what they know of the suspect? So has he posted anything online? Has he talked to anybody, even in the rants that may have occurred when family members or others were around him? Is there anything in what he is saying that connects to what he is alleged to have done? You're going to look for that. So you're looking for threads that tie him through his own words or behavior that led him to, to commit this act. Now, obviously, there is the sort of logical things you have to do in a case is how do you tie the shooter to the scene and how do you tie that weapon to him? My guess is that will go together fairly easily. If nothing else, in the limited CCTV that you and I have seen, it supports he was there, he had the gun, and I suspect they have surviving witnesses that can ID him in a photo lineup, for example. So all of those things would go together to, to physically charge him with first-degree murder. Uh, but this whole psychological stuff that, that you and I are talking about is sort of a, it's a separate issue. It's totally relevant in interviewing him and maybe in getting him out of that house if in fact he's in that house. Um, but it, it, it plays a different role, at least at this juncture in the investigation. Brad Garrett, always appreciate your insight and time. Thank you so much. I want to let the viewers know who are just joining us. We are in Lewiston, Maine tonight, where an urgent manhunt is underway. The suspect in a shooting spree that ended in the deadliest mass shooting in the U.S. this year. We've been following an active situation uh, linked to this case outside of a home connected to the shooter. Police say an Army reservist killed at least 18 people and wounded more than a dozen others last night. Surveillance images show him walking into a bowling alley uh, that was hosting a children's bowling league at the time, carrying what appeared to be an AR-15 style rifle. He then went to a nearby restaurant. Police are searching on the ground and from the air, authorities warn that he is armed and dangerous. Several nearby communities are continue to be on lockdown. Businesses, schools and restaurants all closed. People to, told to shelter in place to stay at home and lock the doors. I want to bring back in our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky. And Aaron, I know that you've been getting new details about what might be going on. Uh, tell us the latest. It, it was incredibly dramatic, Lindsay, to see law enforcement officers with uh, sirens blaring, lights flashing, converge on a home that is associated with the shooting suspect, Robert Card, uh, and a number of tactical vehicles and, and troops come in, drones, helicopters, and uh, our reporters there heard uh, call, calling out commands to, to say, come out, calling the suspect by his name. Uh, and, and the suspicion was that they may have had him surrounded. We're now told by law enforcement officials that that may not be the case, that this particular location was the subject of a search warrant, as other locations today have been in and around the Lewiston area associated with the suspect. And there, there is no expectation at this moment that the suspect they're looking for, Robert Card, is actually inside that location. That doesn't mean they're going to leave. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not going to come back in force in the morning. But uh, right now we're told that they're, despite all of the, the, the drama associated with that location, uh, a lot of that, what you saw, Lindsay, was associated with law enforcement's typical procedures when they're carrying out a search in an environment like this. Uh, the, the lights, 
the calling out of commands uh, done as a, as a precaution to make sure nobody gets hurt who may be around the area, having reporters dim their lights or shut them off entirely uh, so they don't uh, interrupt the law enforcement activity. All of that is standard, uh, although we are told at the moment uh, it does not appear that the, there is going to be an apprehension of the suspect in that location right now, Lindsay. It does seem like there's a, a diminished police presence at that location, at least at this time. And Aaron, we've also learned about a suicide note uh, that was left at the suspect's home. What can you tell us about that? This note was found at one of the locations that police have been searching associated with the shooting suspect, Robert Card. We're told uh, the note uh, was addressed to his son, and it did not, we're told, contain information that could point law enforcement officials to a motive. Rather, uh, it contained what were described to us as rantings uh, and, and also some rather mundane information like bank account numbers and things that, that the son might find useful if his father was no longer there. Uh, it is helping authorities try to, to create a, a fuller picture of who they might be looking for. But the priority, of course, is finding him, Lindsay, uh, because there is no telling where he could be in that thick wooded area around you. In fact, just tonight, uh, the Canadian border authorities have issued their first alert uh, about this shooting suspect in the event that he tried to head north toward Canada. And that gives you an indication of just how widespread this uh, search area is getting. Yeah, lots of concern, not just in this community, but far reaching. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. The names and faces of the victims are now starting to emerge. Among them, a youth bowling coach, a loving husband and grandfather, a mother working part time at the bowling alley, and the cousin who witnessed it all. I had a chance to speak with the family of one of the victims, Trisha Aslin, who was in the bowling alley when the shooter opened fire. Tonight, her cousin Tammy and Tammy's daughter Tony are remembering Trisha and talking about the harrowing moments they both experienced inside that bowling alley. Do you feel like you're still in shock? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I go through my moments where I can feel my emotions are basically closed, mm. where you kind of block them. And then other moments where the, you know, you let the feelings come in. Mm -hmm. But it's um, a very surreal thing. Surreal. How have you been explaining this to Tony? The sad part of it is, is, um, Tony and I got lost in the scuffle. So I didn't know where she was. Um, so I didn't get a chance to really talk with her um, that well or that much till this morning. And um, we, I asked her how she's feeling and how she's doing. And she seems to be doing okay, surprisingly better than I thought. But I also can tell that she hasn't really processed it yet, mm -hmm. that she probably doesn't understand the intensity of it all. Tony, how did you describe it a little while ago? Like a horror movie. Can you just explain what, what happened from your perspective last night? I saw someone get shot, and I saw bl like blood splatter everywhere, and they just fell off their chair and they weren't moving and then one of the bowling coaches said to like get over here because I guess he knew what a gunshot sounded like and so I ran out the exit I didn't know where my mom was and I ran with three other people to subway and so there were a lot of kids right because it was a kids bowling league yes right and so did a lot of the kids run out too? Were you able to see that? I wasn't sure because I was near the candle pin section. There's like big balls, a little, like I think four lanes of big balls and I was bowling and I couldn't tell if like there was other people like going out, like getting shot. All I saw was that one person and I just ran. And what were you? Were you screaming? Were you crying? What were... I was trying to stay a little bit calmer so I wasn't like really hyped up but then when I realized my mom wasn't fine following me I kind of started crying mm. and then when did you see mom mm. not till this morning 
this morning. Mm. And what what was that like, seeing that mom was safe? Mm, happy. Yeah. So, so, mom, tell me about, from your perspective, you're taking your daughter out for a kids' bowling league. It's on something a, we do every Wednesday. Ordinary Wednesday It's night. an ordinary Wednesday. When did you realize something is terribly wrong here? You know, it's sad to say that it took me longer than I expected. Because, you know, we, we talk to everybody talks and says that, you know, you hear gunshots, you're, you know that you're gonna, you know, run, hide or whatever. But when you haven't heard gunshots before and it's the first time you hear, you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So here we are in a bowling alley and we hear this loud, this loudest sound, it's, I guess you could attribute it to almost like a firework going off inside, but like really nearby. And we all heard that sound and I didn't know what it was. And I thought, my God, did something happen to the machinery? Did somebody fall on the bowling alley? Is, you know, is everything okay? Then as I got up, I heard a second shot, but I didn't know it was a shot still at that point. And I saw people scurrying down the bowling alley um, lanes themselves and people scurrying around. And then I saw a few people behind the counter, at least one person behind the counter fall. And I couldn't tell if they were ducking or if they had been injured and people were coming towards me. And I see people behind me like scurrying, but I'm still more or less kind of frozen, which is kind of scary to think about. But I panicked for that brief moment. and. Also then also wondering where she is, but then realizing I can't find her. I don't know where she is, but I have to get safe because at that point I had seen him and he was pointing the gun towards our direction or starting to go towards that direction. And uh, that's when I fell on the ground and I, I hurt myself. But eventually we um, got a table to flip over and we had a booth in that corner that we used to put a wall up. But it really isn't much protection. And that's, and you know it, you know. And the whole time I'm thinking we're sitting ducks um, and we can hear more shots going off. But I'm, the whole time I'm wondering where she is. And I called 911 at um, some point. I used, I didn't know where my phone was at that point. It, it had flown. Um, and one of the kids that bowls with us, um, I was, he was laying behind me, and I used his phone to call 911. And there was another couple of individuals in our group where we were hiding that had also, I guess, tried to reach 911. But yeah, it um, it still doesn't feel real. Mm. Like it just doesn't feel real. Did you think you were going to die? I didn't have that thought at that moment because I think I was more worried about what had happened to her. And I think when it's happening that quickly like that, I don't know if you certainly panic about dying and you certainly think that it's going to happen, but there's, it's amazing how many thoughts can run through your head and yet still not be the thoughts that every might, everybody might think it'd be, it'd be like, you know, your immediate fear of dying. But I, like I said, my concern was more on where she was and whether or not she was safe because I had a fear that she had ran towards the sounds too because, like I said, a few of us adults that were sitting next to each other when we heard it initially responded like somebody needed help or we're looking to make sure that things were okay. It got chaotic after that. Did he seem to just be shooting indiscriminately? <sighs> It didn't feel that way. I mean, at first it did. It just, it, it felt targeted, especially like afterwards when we were laying there and any minute I was waiting to see his face come around that corner. And that was the most daunting part because I'm laying there on my back face, you know, on my back laying flat and there's a table in front of me, but I've got nowhere to go. I'm just sitting there and I can still see the corner and I'm like, he's gonna see me if he comes around that corner. And we could hear some scuffling and a few yells. 
but we didn't know what was going on because of where we were hidden. Mm -hmm. But he took all his aggression out and I don't know, it felt targeted. It felt targeted at that direction. And um, the people who unfortunately lost their lives. And the sad part of it is, is all the kids were right there at the entrance. They're, you know, and thank God to the quick thinking of some parents who didn't even turn to look. They just grabbed the kids and said, run. Mm. And an employee who works there helped them hide behind the bowling alley um, and behind, behind everything. There's a, apparently an office space there and they barricaded themselves in there. And some other people that work there barricaded themselves in the freezer and some in an office. And I mean, uh, most of us were out in the open though. Tell us about your cousin. Oh, the sad part is I didn't know she was there that night. And um, I know she works there because we see her quite often when we go there. She was there, or I know she bowls too. And um, it wasn't until the end of the chaos when somebody says, you know, I need to find out what she, what, you know, that if, how she's doing. And I'm like, oh my God, she's here? And I'm like, I don't see her. I don't see her outside amongst those of us who got out. And then I was told by somebody who was there that's her, but she was the most fun person. She was always happy-go-lucky and, um, I just feel devastated for the loss of her family and especially her son. Um, there's a lot of people who have lost for sure, but she, uh, like I, with her being so close to the kids, I would like to think that she had, was doing something to try to help them. You know, what Don't happened matter. that you and Tony were separated all night? You know, during that whole thing, I didn't know where she was because, like I said, I was frozen there for a split moment. But when I looked for her, she had already bolted, which I already said to her, "I'm like, you did the right thing. You went and got yourself safe. You know, that's fine." You know, keep yourself safe is what I've always said to her. You know, don't come back for me or for anybody. Always keep yourself safe. But so you've I, talked to Tony before about this kind of... Yeah, what to do if ever there's something, mm. you know, not necessarily expecting it would be this, but, you know, if she's ever in an emergency a situation with friends or whatever, is that she should always take care of herself first. And then if she's able to, and it's safe to, to take care of others. But I never would have thought this would be the conversations that I had been preparing her for, ever. Did you have a hard time going to sleep last night? Mm, a little bit, but I was really tired. Mm -hmm. And how are you feeling today? Mm, I feel better because I know that he I know that he isn't caught, but I know I'm still not there. The last question, I, I know he's not caught, Yeah. but do you feel on edge? Do you feel like he's still in the air? I did last night. I felt very vulnerable, for sure, mm -hmm. last night. But yeah, um, I don't think, it's gonna take us a while, but I wanna make sure we feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I don't want her to feel like this is the end. I want to make sure that she understands that there's a moment in our time and that life will move on yeah. and that we will get through this and um, things will be okay. We're going to try to get back to some normalcy as, mm -hmm. as soon as we can and as comfortable as we can. So, I can't thank you enough for talking with us. Tony, I appreciate it. I know it's not easy, but I, I thank you. and I'm so glad you're safe. Me too. We are so grateful that they did talk with us today. And now I want to go back to Whit Johnson, uh, who is live still outside of a home that's been linked to the suspect. Whit, it was certainly a lot of activity out there tonight. Just give us the latest of what's happening now. Absolutely, Lindsay. We're actually witnessing a pretty dramatic reduction in the police posture at this moment. We saw a big line of vehicles. This is the same one that we've seen going out going in. Well, just a few minutes ago, we saw the whole line 
driving back out. And we saw a number of SWAT officers inside those vehicles. We could see through the windows dressed in camouflage tactical gear. However, Lindsay, we do know there's at least one vehicle, one armored vehicle that approached uh, what is we've now learned is actually a shed or a garage next to the home, um, approached that uh, that structure and behind it there are a number of SWAT officers on foot marching behind that armored vehicle as it approached but it has remained quiet we haven't heard any further commands like we were hearing earlier and a dramatic reduction in the police presence but clearly they are not ready to just walk away from this property just yet it is still very much an active scene with the chopper up above we have seen the drones come down it actually looks right now there's a bit more movement uh, with some of the vehicles in front of that property so uh, we certainly have not heard the all clear just yet um, but nothing to suggest that there's any sort of imminent threat in the area just extraordinary reporting from you tonight, Whit, as I know many of us are waiting with bated breath throughout this community, uh, hoping that they will find the suspect. Our thanks to you. I uh, want to bring in ABC News law enforcement contributor once again, Jared Berguan. Uh, he was police chief in San Bernardino, California in 2015 when a mass shooter killed 14 people at a holiday party. Uh, thanks so much again for coming back on the show. Uh, this shooter appears to, to fit many of the behavioral characteristics of, of the majority of, of mass shooters. Can you elaborate on that thought? We know a lot about people that have done this. I mean, every single time that there is a mass shooting, there is a an extensive study that goes into the profile of who that person is and what their motivation might be. And the reason we do that is because we believe that if we can understand the motivations, we can effectively take steps to prevent future cases. And undoubtedly, we have been successful at doing that before. We know that in the cases of several school shootings, we have really educated people to look out for certain types of behaviors that have, that have, uh, you know, uh, gotten kids, uh, you know, before uh, they had an opportunity to do something. So we know that there's some effectiveness to this. Again, what makes this particular case a little bit unique, uh, and, it, and it, it, it has happened before, but this business of a suspect escaping a mass shooting is somewhat rare. A vast majority of these, uh, the suspect knows that the shooting itself is the end game, and he knows, uh, he or she knows, but in most cases he knows that he's either going to uh, die himself or he's going to die in a confrontation with law enforcement uh, when they get in there. And these are the reasons law enforcement trains to go in so quickly to confront that shooter. This is going to continue to be unique. Uh, this will be, uh, uh, in many ways, something that will be studied for a long, long time. I want to add one more piece. Uh, we have, we've looked at a lot of these shootings that have happened in the past, and we understand that uh, a gun in the hand of somebody that doesn't have any training, isn't good or proficient with firearms, can still be very dangerous and can still do a lot of damage. But a gun in the hands of somebody who is really, truly trained in tactics and firearms and moving and shooting and many of those types of things are exponentially, exponentially more dangerous. Uh, and this is one of those cases where uh, it appears that he had a lot of proficiency and that made him extraordinarily dangerous. And just to recap what we're seeing right now, some live images. Uh, you see uh, combat gear as people are walking through the brush, once again near that property where Whit Johnson is. So while the presence has certainly diminished, uh, they have not left um, and are still uh, quite active on, on that scene. Uh, this is, as we're seeing here and, and beyond, a massive operation. You have more than 350 law enforcement personnel from local and state police, multiple federal agencies take us inside just how something like this works and and who's doing the overall coordination so there are things in uh, the first responder business that we refer to as the incident command system undoubtedly they have something of that nature set up they have a command center they have all of the representative agencies that have a person inside of that command center and that command center by virtue of the way that it is structured has different people with a responsibility over certain aspects of that operation. So I'll give you an example. In the particular case of searching for the suspect, undoubtedly there is one incident commander within that ICS system that is tasked with organizing the search operations. 
Now, what makes this exceptionally challenging is SWAT teams are used to working together within the context of their own team, or maybe even within a team that is in a neighboring community. It is, uh, it is difficult when you bring teams from all over the state and in all over the nation in many cases as both local, state, and federal officials come together. And the reason it makes it challenging is that even though tactical work in law enforcement is tactical work and there's a lot of commonality in it, not every tactical team operates in exactly the same way. And what makes it extraordinarily difficult is doing the search in a systematic way uh, that you're not you're not missing things, you're not duplicating efforts. You don't have uh, SWAT teams that are uh, that are not understanding what other things. It makes it very, very difficult and very challenging, and it's 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 chaotic. We can imagine, uh, Mr. Bogowan. We thank you so much for your expertise. Appreciate you joining us and giving us your time. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California. On the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina on the 20th. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. We are reporting on the ground tonight from Lewiston, Maine, where America's enduring gun problem has reared its ugly head yet again. At least 18 people are dead, several dozen injured in this, the country's worst mass shooting of the year, the 565th mass shooting year to date, the deadliest since the Uvalde school shooting. We've witnessed some tense images the past few hours of authorities outside of the suspected shooter's home. Our Whit Johnson is there outside of that home and will join us in just a moment. As you can imagine, with the situation so fluid, this community is on edge and in shock as it grapples with the tremendous loss of life here. And we are now learning more details about some of the victims. Joseph Walker, the manager of the Schmengi's Bar and Grill, whose father says he attempted to confront the gunman with a knife. Bob Violet, a youth bowling coach who was at the local bowling alley, which was the site of the second shooting. Trisha Aslin, also killed at that bowling alley. Stephen Vozella, Bill Brackett, and Brian McFarlane, who were part of a gathering of deaf people playing cornhole at the bar and grill, among others. 
Every day in the U.S., about 123 people are killed from gun violence. At least 111 more are shot and wounded, which means by the time we wrap up just an hour of coverage tonight, an estimated five more people will die at the hands of a gun. Another four will be injured. Here in Lewiston last night, the suspect, a man police have identified as a 40-year-old firearms teacher and Army reservist who struggled with mental illness, carried out these deadly attacks at two locations about three miles apart part, a bowling alley and a restaurant. And with this attack comes increased focus on Maine's lax gun laws that may have exacerbated the loss of life we're seeing. Tonight we have comprehensive coverage of the carnage, the victims and the man who police say is responsible, along with stories of bravery and heroism as yet another American community lowers its flags and mourns those lost. Let's get right to Whit Johnson, who's outside of the suspect's home. Whit, uh, what can you tell us about what you've witnessed these past few hours and, and what's going on right now? Well, Lindsay, after all that, it appears that's a wrap. We just saw the last vehicles that were up against the property there pull out, back up, get back in a row, and drive out. As far as we can tell, there's not a single vehicle left. Um, it's completely dark in the background there. Um, this after really almost to the minute a very dramatic two hours that we witnessed live on the air here when all of the SWAT vehicles came up. Uh, officers in tactical gear got out of the car, walked off into the misty woods over here and surrounded this property. Um, we heard those commands, even even calling the suspect's name out loud, asking him to come out of the property with his hands up and that they didn't want to hurt him. They didn't want anybody to get hurt. Um, after all of that, though, we saw a number of maneuvers. We saw one of the armored vehicles actually go in and approach uh, the property, which we later learned was more of a shed or a garage that was attached to the home. Um, they approached that with a, a probe type device, like a ram, at the end of the armored vehicle. And there were a number of SWAT officers in a row that approached the property as well in behind. Um, but after all of that, the commands died down. And it appears that uh, they are done with this property, at least for the night. But, Lindsay, as you know, um, the fact that officers are leaving here means that this suspect, this accused killer, is still at large. And it means that this community remains gripped with fear after the deadliest mass shooting so far of 2023. You're right. So many people here just waiting for some kind of conclusion one way or another. And such a stark contrast. Now we see that darkness right behind you where it was all just lit up and, and so active before. And, and perhaps with some hope uh, that people were going to get that, that needed closure. Whit Johnson, our thanks to you for your coverage over the last few hours. And now I want to bring back in ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Brad Garrett. Brad, uh, thanks for coming back on. Uh, as activity at that house where police were carrying out a search warrant has, has dwindled down. Uh, we're now 24 hours since the first shooting took place. Uh, what challenges do these search teams face as the hours continue to, to tick by? So, Lindsay, all of these searches are driven or leads are driven by intelligence that they've gotten. I think something uh, aroused them enough to go back to this house again where Witt has been standing outside. Um, and that's going to drive the next move in this case. What pieces of information? Are there other properties? Does he have a boat? Uh, could he have gotten to Canada? I mean, as the crow flies, he's not that far from Canada. All of these things they're going to look at. In other words, has he left the area? Again, assuming that he's alive, and I think that could be a big if. Um, and so that's, that's the direction this is going. The problem with cases is that when the leads dwindle, then there's less activity for investigators to work the leads. I think this will stay rich for a long time. Uh, and my sense would be that he's probably not in Canada, that he's someplace close to maybe where they've already searched. They just haven't come upon him yet. When you say it'll stay rich for a long time, what do you mean by that? That because it's such an horrendous case, there's going to be people that will volunteer information or provide information, uh, and in particular, sightings. You know, it's one thing when a crime is committed in certain communities, in certain towns, cities, in cities where it's difficult to get people to help you. 
This case probably has the exact opposite going on. You, everybody wants to help you. Uh, and so I think the leads will continue to pour in. Now, are they relevant? Are they worthwhile? That's another story. But this case is not going to go away. It's such an horrendous crime that law enforcement will, will, will stay sort of the long game here. I'm just only suggesting that if, if in fact, uh, Mr. Card is no longer with us and he's gone someplace that he, he's not going to readily be found, you can see where this could go for weeks into months. Brad Garrett, our thanks to you. I want to bring back in our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky. Aaron, uh, you have new details on that situation we saw tonight at the suspect's home? It sure was dramatic, calling out the suspect's name, lights, sirens, uh, big spotlights at times, helicopters, drones. All of that, the authorities say, is part of a, a standard procedure to safely carry out a search warrant at a location that's associated with the mass shooting suspect. As Whit Johnson reports, it appears now that a number of the SWAT teams that had moved in and other tactical gear are all packing up and moving away. That's not to say they won't be back to that same location. The authorities say they're being thorough by searching as many locations associated with the suspected shooter as possible, but there is no expectation at this moment tonight, Lindsay, that the, the shooter is going to be apprehended at that home. And we've been talking, uh, Aaron, about uh, information about a possible suicide note by the shooter addressed to his son. Uh, what can you tell us about that? That note was found as authorities were carrying out a different search at one of the properties associated with the shooting suspect, Robert Card. It was addressed to his son, we're told. And while it did not reveal any details about why the mass shootings may have occurred, it, it did contain what sources describe to us as rantings uh, and also some rather basic information like the suspect's bank account records to perhaps assist his son should the father no longer be there. Uh, the authorities have uh, interest in this because it helps build out the profile of who they're looking for even though it doesn't necessarily speak to motive but but it also perhaps tells them what he was planning and, and, and if he is going to perhaps uh, be, be found dead or alive. Uh, we don't know for sure that the suspect uh, died by suicide, but that's the substance of the note that they found at one of the properties. And so many here just eager for him to be found one way or another. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. And now to what we're learning about the suspect's history, including the warning signs and the stay that the alleged gunman had at a mental health facility uh, just this past July. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has those details. This past summer, military officials at Camp Smith training site, just north of New York City, became increasingly concerned about the mental health of Army reservist Robert Card. In July, Card was acting, quote, erratically, a source telling ABC News he was threatening other soldiers with violence. And a law enforcement bulletin described to ABC News portrays Card as hearing voices and talking about going to, quote, shoot up a National Guard base. The military called the New York State Police and Card was command directed to go to the Keller Army Community Hospital near West Point, where he stayed for two weeks. When pressed today about Card's mental health and access to firearms, Maine authorities said it's under investigation. If you're talking about behavioral health issues and how that impacts this situation, uh, I would expect you'll hear back from us on that uh, in the future. Multiple sources telling ABC News at least one firearm was recovered in a vehicle Card allegedly abandoned. Those sources also telling ABC News they're concerned he may have access to other weapons. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. 24 hours after this horror, what happened here is still sinking in for this entire community. And we are con reporting continues now with World News Tonight anchor David Muir. Tonight, these small New England communities in and around Lewiston, Maine, north of Portland, gripped in fear. Nearly 24 hours later, families are still being told tonight by authorities to stay home and to lock their doors. 
All day today, we could see the main streets here, the back roads, eerily quiet. Public safety alerts going off as we were driving in our car reporting here. Drivers being told the shelter-in-place order has been extended across two counties here. Tonight, the urgent manhunt for the suspect who opened fire during the dinner hour last night at two different locations where neighbors, where families and their children were gathered. Tonight, the death toll, at least 18 people killed, 13 injured, several critically. Please respond to the town of Lewiston. The first 911 calls coming in at 6.56 p.m. last night. Maritime recreation for an active shooter incident, multiple people down. Parents shielding their children, some running for their lives. It was youth night at the local bowling alley. Just in time recreation, it's called, also known here as the spare time bowling alley. Seven people were killed inside. Authorities say six males and one female. Well, we were inside and just normal night of bowling and out of nowhere, he just came in and there was a loud pop. Thought it was a balloon. I had my back turned to the door. And as soon as I turned and saw it, it was not a balloon. He was holding a weapon. I just booked it down the lane and I slid basically into where the pins are and climbed up in the machine and was on top of the machines for about 10 minutes until the cops got there. Megan Hutchinson and her 10-year-old daughter Zoe were inside. They raced to barricade themselves in a storage room. When I turned around, I saw the shooter right like behind me had just come in the door. Between the lanes, there's um, some swinging doors like where they keep all the mechanical stuff out back. So we kind of all just ran that way. Zoe's leg grazed by a bullet. I never thought I'd grow up and get a bullet in my leg. And it's just like, like, why? Like, why do people do this? I was more worried about, like, am I going to live? Am I going to make it out of here? Like, what's going to happen? Are the cops going to come? And then 12 minutes after those first 911 calls from the bowling alley, 7.08 p.m., the calls to 911 gunfire at a second location. At about 7.08 p.m., the communication center received multiple 911 calls about an active shooter inside of a Schmengi's Billiards. This time, Schmengi's Bar and Grill, just four miles from that bowling alley. Eight people killed inside, one person killed outside. Less than an hour later, 8.06 p.m., the sheriff's office releasing these chilling images of the suspect. Tonight, identified as 40-year-old Robert Card. Sources say Card is a U.S. Army reservist. A local law enforcement bulletin describing him as a certified firearms instructor. Authorities concerned the suspect's tactical knowledge, making him an even greater threat. The images showing him entering that bowling alley, his AK-47-style rifle raised to his shoulder, aiming his weapon. Nearly two hours later, 9.56 p.m., the suspect's white Subaru found with the doors open at a boat landing in Lisbon, Maine, about eight miles from those two Lewiston locations. He should be considered armed and dangerous. Based on our investigation, we believe this is someone that should not be approached. In the overnight hours and all day today, the all-out search for the suspect. The signs in so many communities here, shelter in place. Helicopters searching overhead, aircraft with infrared cameras. The suspect now wanted tonight on multiple counts of murder. Currently, there is an arrest warrant for eight counts of murder for Mr. Card. Um, and the reason it's eight counts, because 10 people have not yet been identified. As those people are identified, uh, the counts will probably go to the total of 18. The medical teams racing into action. Ambulances rushing to the scene, loading victims, hospitals inundated. 100 off-duty medical staff racing in to help. Outside, police guarding the entrance. We had a first patient arrive at 7.24 p.m. And over the next 45 minutes, uh, we received a total of 14 patients. Uh, eight of those patients were admitted to our hospital. Three of those patients are deceased. From her hospital bed today, Jennifer Zanka telling us she was having dinner with friends at Schmengi's Bar and Grill when the shooting began at that second location. When I turned around, we all turned around and realized what was happening. We dropped to the ground. And that's when I think I was shot in the arm. She'd been shot, but this retired nurse still escaped through the back door. I kept my hand on my, my arm I, like a tourniquet because it was bleeding pretty heavily. And I went to hide behind the dumpster. There was another gentleman there. But I knew I needed to get help. 
rushed to the hospital, a doctor she used to work with now operating on her. I was one of the lucky ones. My, um, if the bullet had been in either direction, I definitely would not have survived. She knows she survived while 18 others did not. This was the post on Facebook just today. A wife asking about her husband who worked at that bar and grill. Tracy Walker writing about her husband, Joseph. Please pray. I haven't heard anything about my husband. He was at Schmengi's. Tonight, after waiting 14 hours for word, the family learned he was killed. His father, Leroy Walker, describes the emptiness. Your whole body, everything goes out of you. Your heart goes flip flop and you got, it feels like some, there's a vice in you. Your head can't take it and, and uh, you just feel like you're going to blow up. That's what you feel like, I'll blow out. I'm not sure which way, but, but you, you got no legs. Your mind can't, you're thinking, but you're not knowing what you're thinking. You're not, you don't even know where you're going. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an empty, it's, uh, it's just hard. I don't know how some people, I've, I've listened to people try to explain when something happens in these shootouts and stuff. I don't know how they do it. I, I can't explain it, tell you the truth, I can't. I can tell you though, it's empty, it's empty. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I'm sorry. Uh, well, we'll have to just wait and see, I guess. Leroy is a local councilman here. He says state police told the family that his son was a hero who grabbed a knife behind that bar to try to stop the gunman, but that he was killed. Leroy's family showed us the article when his son was a hero back in high school, helping to stop a thief at a local jewelry store. His father was not surprised to learn that his son tried to help again. He says he'll miss the visits from his son after he would finish work. Those visits at night when he got off shift, you'll miss gotta those kill most. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna kill me. Yeah. 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 The only other thing is the, the other poor people that are out there doing the same thing as I'm doing right now, having no place to really go. I, uh, feel like you've got a place to go. It's just emptiness. It's a, uh, I feel so sorry for them too. Our thanks to David Muir for that. The names and faces of the victims are now starting to emerge. Among them, a youth bowling coach, a loving husband and grandfather, a mother working part-time at the bowling alley, and the cousin who witnessed it all. I had the chance to speak with the family of one of the victims, Trisha Aslin, who was in the bowling alley when the shooter opened fire. Tonight, her cousin Tammy and Tammy's daughter Tony are remembering Trisha and talking about the harrowing moments they both experienced inside that bowling alley. Do you feel like you're still in shock? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I go through my moments where I can feel my emotions are basically closed. Mm. where you kind of block them and then other moments where the you know you let the feelings come in mm -hmm. but it's um, a very surreal thing surreal how have you been explaining this to tony the sad part of it is is um tony and i got lost in the scuffle so i didn't know where she was um so i didn't get a chance to really talk with her um that well or that much till this morning and um we i asked her how she's feeling and how she's doing and she seems to be doing okay surprisingly better than i thought but i also can tell that she hasn't really processed it yet mm -hmm. that she probably doesn't understand the intensity of it all tony how did you describe it a little while ago like a horror movie can you just explain what, what happened from your perspective last night? I saw someone get shot, and I saw, bl like, blood splatter everywhere, and they just fell off their chair, and they weren't moving. And then one of the bowling coaches said to, like, get over here, because I guess he knew what a gunshot sounded like. And so... I ran out the exit. I didn't know where my mom was, and I ran with three other people to Subway. 
And so there were a lot of kids, right? Because it was a kids bowling league. Yes. Right? And so did a lot of the kids run out too? Were you able to see that? I wasn't sure because I was near the candle pin section. There's like big balls, a little, like I think four lanes of big balls. And I was bowling and I couldn't tell if like there was other people like going out like getting shot, all I saw was that one person and I just ran. And what were you, were you screaming? Were you crying? What, what... I was trying to stay a little bit calmer, so I wasn't like really hyped up, but then when I realized my mom wasn't fine, following me, I kind of started crying. Mm. And then when did you see mom? Mm. Not till this morning. This morning. Mm. And what what was that like seeing that mom was safe? Mm, happy. Yeah. So, so mom, tell me about from your perspective. You're taking your daughter out for a kids bowling league. It's on something a, we do every Wednesday. Ordinary Wednesday. It's night. an ordinary Wednesday. When did you realize something is terribly wrong here? You know, it's sad to say that it took me longer than I expected. Because, you know, we, we talk to everybody talks and says that, you know, you hear gunshots, you're, you know that you're going to, you know, run, hide, or whatever. But when you haven't heard gunshots before and it's the first time you hear it, you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So here we are in a bowling alley and we hear this loud, this loudest sound. It's, I guess you could attribute it to almost like a firework going off inside, but like really nearby. And we all heard that sound and I didn't know what it was. And I thought, my God, did something happen to the machinery? Did somebody fall on the bowling alley? Is, you know, is everything okay? Then as I got up, I heard a second shot, but I didn't know it was a shot still at that point. And I saw people scurrying down the bowling alley, um, lanes themselves and people scurrying around and then I saw a few people behind the counter, at least one person behind the counter fall. And I couldn't tell if they were ducking or if they had been injured and people were coming towards me. And I see people behind me like scurrying, but I'm still more or less kind of frozen, which is kind of scary to think about, but I panicked for that brief moment. And also then also wondering where she is, but then realizing I can't find her. I don't know where she is, but I have to get safe because at that point I had seen him and he was pointing the gun towards our direction or starting to go towards that direction. And uh, that's when I fell on the ground and I, I hurt myself. But eventually we um, got a table to flip over and we had a booth in that corner that we used to put a wall up. But it really isn't much protection. And that's, and you know it, you know. And the whole time I'm thinking we're sitting ducks um, and we can hear more shots going off. But I'm, the whole time I'm wondering where she is. And I called 911 at um, some point. I used, I didn't know where my phone was at that point. It, it had flown. Um, and one of the kids that bowls with us, um, I was, he was laying behind me, and I used his phone to call 911. And there was another couple of individuals in our group where we were hiding that had also, I guess, tried to reach 911. But, yeah, it, um, it still doesn't feel real. Mm. Like, it just doesn't feel real. Did you think you were going to die? I didn't have that thought at that moment because I think I was more worried about what had happened to her. And I think when it's happening that quickly like that, I don't know if you certainly panic about dying and you certainly think that it's going to happen, but there's, it's amazing how many thoughts can run through your head and yet still not be the thoughts that every might, everybody might think it'd be, it'd be like, you know, your immediate fear of dying. But I, like I said, my concern was more on where she was and whether or not she was safe because I had a fear that she had ran towards the sounds too because 
like I said, a few of us adults that were sitting next to each other when we heard it initially responded like somebody needed help or we're looking to make sure that things were okay. It got chaotic after that. Did he seem to just be shooting indiscriminately? It didn't feel that way. I mean, at first it did. It just, it, it felt targeted, especially like afterwards when we were laying there and any minute I was waiting to see his face come around that corner. And that was the most daunting part because I'm laying there on my back face, you know, on my back laying flat and there's a table in front of me, but I've got nowhere to go. I'm just sitting there and I can still see the corner and I'm like, he's gonna see me if he comes around that corner. And we could hear some scuffling and a few yells, but we didn't know what was going on because of where we were hidden. But he took all his aggression out and I don't know, it felt targeted. It felt targeted at that direction. And um, the people who unfortunately lost their lives and the sad part of it is, is all the kids were right there at the entrance. They're, you know, and thank God to the quick thinking of some parents who didn't even turn to look. They just grabbed the kids and said, run. Mm. And an employee who works there helped them hide behind the bowling alley um, and behind, behind everything. There's a, apparently an office space there and they barricaded themselves in there. And some other people that work there barricaded themselves in the freezer and some in an office. And I mean, uh, most of us were out in the open though. Tell us about your cousin. Oh, the sad part is I didn't know she was there that night. And um, I know she works there because we see her quite often when we go there. She was there or I know she bowls too. And. Um, it wasn't until the end of the chaos when somebody says, you know, I need to find out what she, what, you know, that if, how she's doing. And I'm like, oh my God, she's here? And I'm like, I don't see her. I don't see her outside amongst those of us who got out. And then I was told by somebody who was there that saw her. <laughs> but she was the most fun person. She was always happy-go-lucky and... Um, I just feel devastated for the loss of her family and especially her son. Um, there's a lot of people who I've lost for sure. But she, uh, I'd like, I, with her being so close to the kids, I would like to think that she had, was doing something to try to help them, you know. What oh, happened that you and Tony were separated all night? You know, during that whole thing, I didn't know where she was because, like I said, I was frozen there for a split moment, but when I looked for her, she had already bolted, which I already said to her, I'm like, you did the right thing. You went and got yourself safe. You know, that's fine. You know, keep yourself safe is what I've always said to her. You know, don't come back for me or for anybody. Always keep yourself safe. But so you've I, talked to Tony before about this kind of... Yeah, what to do if ever there's something, mm. you know, not necessarily expecting it would be this, but, you know, if she's ever in an emergency a situation with friends or whatever, is that she should always take care of herself first. And then if she's able to and it's safe to, to take care of others. But I never would have thought this would be the conversations that I had been preparing her for, ever. Did you have a hard time going to sleep last night? Mm, a little bit, but I was really tired. Mm -hmm. And how are you feeling today? Mm, I feel better because I know that he, I know that he isn't caught, but I know I'm still not there. The last question, I, I know he's not caught, Yeah. but do you feel on edge? Do you feel like he's still in the area? I did last night. I felt very vulnerable, for sure, mm -hmm. last night. But yeah, um, I don't think, it's gonna take us a while, but I wanna make sure we feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I don't want her to feel like this is the end. I wanna make sure that she understands that there's a moment in our time and that life will move on yeah. and that we will get through this and um, things will be okay. 
we're gonna try to get back to some normalcy as mm -hmm. as soon as we can and as comfortable as we can. So I can't thank you enough for talking with us. Tony, I appreciate it. I know it's not easy, but I, I thank you and I'm so glad you're safe. Me too. So many trying to get back to normalcy. Our thanks to them for that conversation. We will continue our coverage from Lewiston, Maine, as the urgent investigation unfolds and the community tries to process such a great loss. But still much more to get to here on Prime. The rising death toll in Mexico after Hurricane Otis made landfall as a powerful Category 5 storm. But next, the major developments in Israel's war with Hamas as the Israeli military raids Gaza ahead of a potential invasion. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California. On the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most-watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're in Lewiston, Maine, once again tonight, where police say an Army reservist killed at least 18 people and wounded more than a dozen others last night. We've witnessed some tense images the past few hours of authorities outside the suspected shooter's home, but it ended up being a false alarm. Turns out, at least they believe he was not inside. We have just learned authorities believe this was not a completely random attack and that he had connections with the locations he allegedly targeted. They believe his ex-girlfriend was at one of those locations. And tonight, we are also monitoring a major development in Israel's war with Hamas, among other news for that. I'll toss it over to Phil Lipoff, who's in our studio in New York. Hey, Phil. 
Hey, Lindsay, thank you. We'll get back to you in just a few minutes. But right now, a major development in Israel's war with Hamas. The Israeli military sending tanks into Gaza, laying the groundwork for what they say is the next stage of combat. It's airstrikes targeting an area in southern Gaza where Israel has already told Palestinians to go. ABC's Matt Gutman in Tel Aviv for us again tonight. Tonight, Israel claiming it conducted its largest ground incursion into the Gaza Strip since the October 7th terror attack by Hamas. Israel releasing infrared video showing bulldozers near a damaged border fence in northern Gaza, a column of tanks moving in, opening fire, hitting multiple targets. The Israeli military calling it a targeted raid, claiming it destroyed Hamas infrastructure, saying it was preparing for the next stages of combat. This was an early, small, tactical incursion into the Gaza Strip. This is us preparing the battlefield for future operations. And Israel today launching devastating new airstrikes on southern Gaza, claiming it targeted Hamas. Toppling a high rise, this wailing baby pulled out alive, encrusted in dust. And tonight, with 224 hostages still in the hands of Hamas, a protest growing in Tel Aviv for their return. One of those hostages, Erez Calderon. Today is his 12th birthday. Cake, candles, those balloons floating skyward. This video showing the moment Erez was kidnapped by Hamas. His mother, Hadas, has never watched it because she sees that moment played out in her mind. And I can hear him, I can hear him all the time in my... screaming to me, Mom, Mom. Mom, save me, Mom, save me. I can hear him. She was in kibbutz near Oz, locked in a different house when her ex-husband and two children were taken into Gaza. i never been so far from them. Three weeks now. I miss them so much. <laughs> to get him and the others back, the family's demanding Israel negotiate. Give them whatever they want. Give them whatever they want. You want 4,000 prisoners? Give them. Don't forget. Don't forget your citizens. Lindsay, we've seen this growing protest movement in Israel that is calling for first the release of the hostages from Gaza, and then Israel can do whatever it wants in terms of war. It's picking up steam because they say Israel has to save those living hostages whose lives are hanging in the balance first. Now, there are urgent talks being spearheaded by Qatar, obviously along with Hamas, Egypt, the U.S., and Israel, to release what is being described as a large number of hostages, possibly in the dozens. Of course, the families of the hostages fear that if that ground incursion begins first, the window for saving their loved ones closes. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman from Israel. Matt, thank you. Let's turn now to Capitol Hill, where Congress is getting back to work following the election of a new speaker. And the debate on getting more aid to Israel is at the top of the agenda. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Washington. Jay, what's the latest on moving forward that $105 billion aid package that President Biden has proposed? Well, Phil, we know today that President Biden met with the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, in a brief meeting that Johnson characterized as productive. Hakeem Jeffries, the top Democrat in the House, was also there. And that's because there's broad bipartisan support in the Senate to pass that $105 billion foreign aid package the president has called for that includes funding for Israel and also funding for Ukraine. But any hang-ups on that package would be in the House. And the White House, as I said, wants to link funding for Israel to funding for Ukraine. And the question becomes, how do Republicans in the House react to that? I spoke with a few today, and they say they believe funding for Israel should be separate from funding for Ukraine, including Byron Donalds, who's a staunch, staunch conservative ally of the new speakers. And so what's facing Mike Johnson now is whether or not he will agree with the White House on this issue after that meeting with the president and go forward linking these two, or if he'll try to buck the president and try to separate the two, Phil. And Jay, this all comes, as you know, as Congress will meet to try to avert a government shutdown after that long delay to pick a new speaker. What's the timeline on those efforts, and can they get a deal done in time this time to avert a shutdown? 
Well, Speaker Johnson has laid out an ambitious plan to try to avert a shutdown. It involves passing the eight of the 12 remaining spending bills that would fully fund the government by that mid-November November 17th deadline. They passed one spending bill today. They've got seven more to go to fully fund the government. But Johnson also acknowledges that that might not all get done by that November date, and he's looking at the possibility of a temporary stopgap funding measure that would keep the federal government open while the rest of those bills pass, but passing a temporary funding measure is what got Kevin McCarthy in trouble and got Kevin McCarthy ousted. And so another question facing Johnson is how do the conservatives in his conference react to that? We've heard from some who say they're willing to give him more leeway than they gave Kevin McCarthy, but still feel the clock very much ticking toward that eventual possible government shutdown. All right, Jay O'Brien from Capitol Hill. Jay, thanks so much. We turn now to some other major headlines tonight. The death toll is rising from Hurricane Otis in Mexico. At least 27 people have been killed when the powerful Category 5 storm made landfall near Acapulco. Mexican authorities say four people are missing and the military has actually been deployed to that area. More images from the popular vacation spot showing sweeping wind and widespread damage. Many are searching for loved ones and help as the hurricane rips through the Pacific Coast beach town. A landlord accused of murder, attempted murder, and a hate crime in an attack on his Palestinian-American tenant and her son was indicted by an Illinois grand jury. The eight-count indictment against the suspect tracks the charges that were filed soon after that fatal stabbing of the six-year-old and the wounding of his mother. Authorities say the victims were targeted because of their Muslim faith. The boy's mother also says the suspect was upset over the Israel-Hamas war and attacked them after she had urged him to, quote, Pray for peace. Toyota is recalling about 751,000 large SUVs in the U.S. to fix a problem with the tabs that hold the front bumper covers on. The company says in a statement the SUVs have resin front low bumper covers that are connected with mounting tabs. If there is even a minor impact to the lower bumper cover assembly, the mounting tabs could detach and parts of the assembly could fall onto the road and obviously that becomes a hazard. The recall covers certain Toyota Highlanders from the 2020 through 2020 three model years, including gas electric hybrids. Now we want to get back to our top story of the night and anchor Lindsay Davis, who is in Lewiston, Maine. Lindsay. All right, thanks, Phil. As we continue to cover this tragedy in Maine, there's still much more to get to. Coming up at the center of all of this is a small town with strong bonds, how local leaders are working to try to help this community heal. But next, in the light of another mass shooting, workers are trying to help the community heal. But we take a closer look at gun laws and gun deaths by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news, anytime, anywhere, streaming 24-7, straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Giffords, the organization founded by former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, gives the state of Maine an F on gun safety laws. We take a look at gun laws and gun deaths in Maine by the numbers. Prior to today, 178 people in Maine died from gun violence so far this year. That's more than 12 for 100,000 people and the 14th lowest gun death rate among the states, according to the Giffords Center. The state allows open and concealed carry and requires zero background checks for private gun sales. It also has zero permits or firearm registration for anyone over 21 or 18 with military service. The Gifford Center says this all puts the state at the bottom half nationwide, ranking it 27th among the 50 states. They say Maine also supplies guns used in crimes to other states at the 29th highest rate in the country. Just this summer, the Maine House of Representatives narrowly passed a bill that would require background checks on private gun sales for the bill died in the Senate the next day and did not become law. With those numbers in mind, many advocacy groups are weighing in on what's happening here in Lewiston, Maine, as we stay on top of the latest developments. Coming up, the president of the Brady uh, organization tells us the changes the group is advocating for and why they believe it's so difficult to pass sweeping gun control legislation. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy's leg was stained her husband's blood. I want them to see what they have done to Jack. Common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to the stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot. But Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline and Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back, everyone. We are in Lewiston, Maine tonight, where police say an Army Reserve has killed at least 18 people and wounded more than a dozen others last night. We've witnessed some tense images the past few hours of authorities outside the suspected shooter's home, but it ended up being a false alarm. They say at this point they do not believe he was inside. We have just learned authorities believe this was not a completely random attack and he had connections with the locations he allegedly targeted. They believe his ex-girlfriend was at one of the locations. Uh, for the moment, I want to bring in Chris Brown, president of Brady, the country's oldest organization dedicated to gun violence prevention. Uh, first, I'd like to pose the same question to you, just getting your reaction to, to seeing this latest act of gun violence in our country. Well, it, it never gets easier. I mean, it's horrific to think about families spending time together at a bowling alley, enjoying time together at a restaurant living life and then suddenly having everything change. You know, I'm thinking about uh, the father and son, uh, Bill and Aaron Young. Aaron was only 14 years old, enjoying an evening or afternoon at the bowling alley, and now they're no longer with us. And it uh, fills me with despair. Our families, America's children, don't have to live this way and certainly don't have to die this way. Your organization advocates for the banning of assault weapons, and it does appear that this shooter was using one last night. I want to play for you a moment from a press conference from earlier today with Democratic Congressman Jared Golden of Maine seeming to change his position. Let's take a listen. I have opposed efforts to ban deadly weapons of war like the assault rifle used to carry out this crime. The time has now come for me to take responsibility for this failure which is why I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles like the one used by the sick perpetrator of this mass killing. He is a Marine Corps veteran and one of the most conservative Democrats in the House. How significant is that change? I hope it's very significant. I was watching that press conference in real time. You expect uh, too often in today's world that individuals who are in those situations who have not supported any reasonable gun control measures, which is unfortunately the history of Representative Golden, that they can sometimes double down on that. We saw that far too often with politicians representing constituents in Parkland, et cetera. And I was music to my ears, and Brady is ready, willing, and able to do whatever we can to support Representative Golden and a huge number of additional members in Congress who want to enact an assault weapons ban, which is a universally supported policy initiative. Even a majority of gun owners want this to happen. I, I just hope that Representative Golden can also understand that there are a number of additional laws that also need to be put into effect at the federal level, expanding the Bright Brady background check system being among them so that Mainers can truly be protected and that all of our citizens across this country can actually feel safer. That's what he said. The illusion of safety was something I felt and now I realize that I need to do something to enhance our policy, to protect our citizens. That's how every elected official should feel. We know no one is immune to this. All of us as Americans deserve to live, exist in safe communities. And that means communities free from gun violence. Frankly, Representative Golden, who has not been historically a champion, raising his voice, committing to really take to the House floor and talk about why this is necessary as someone who himself is uh, a veteran. We need more gun owners to lift up their voices and demand that this happen. And we're seeing that more and more and more. But all of us as Americans, especially those who own firearms, who have enough, please raise your voice. Join Brady in calling for a renewal of the assault weapons ban. We need you. We've seen a lot of discussion today about the shooter's mental health history, uh, but I want to share a post from you on X, formerly Twitter, today saying this. Uh, the idea that mental health is at the root of gun violence is an ableist lie designed to deflect responsibility from the gun industry. Call it out wherever you see it. I explain your position there. Look, I mean, it's sort of like when you look at uh, folks talking about Maine's yellow flag law 
That's not a law that really has done anything to remove guns from individuals who are exhibiting behaviors that indicate that they are at risk. Many of those individuals may or may not have a diagnosable mental illness. The United States doesn't have any more mental illness than any other country in the world. We have a lot more gun violence. Why is that? Because we have 450 million firearms and we're not doing enough to ensure that the systems we have to protect ourselves and to take guns away from individuals exhibiting behaviors that they are at risk actually work. That's where we need to focus our attention. The fact of the matter is, if you have a diagnosed mental illness in this country, the risk to you that you will be the victim of gun violence is significantly higher than you will perpetrate gun violence. That's what that tweet was about. That's what that X tweet was about. And we really want to mm -hmm. take away the bogeyman that this is about mentally ill people having easy access to guns. It's about people who are at risk having too, too easy access to guns. And let's focus on those kinds of behaviors and enact actual strong red flag laws, which Maine does not have. If it did, things might be different. So that when we see these behaviors and we understand that there's a potential risk, we can take action effectively to address that risk and remove firearms when necessary from individuals who pose a risk. We thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on. Finally tonight from here in Lewiston, where so many are struggling to understand just what happened here on what should have been an ordinary Wednesday night. The welcome to Maine sign at the Maine, New Hampshire border says the way life should be. But tonight, the residents of this community have joined a growing number of people throughout this country trying to understand why their lives may never be the same. The images of this shell shock community from the difficult aftermath at a bowling alley and a local watering hole where a group of deaf people should have just been able to have a carefree evening playing cornhole. To my home, to my neighbors, to my city. These images are from here in Lewiston, Maine, as the city tries to comprehend what happens next. Calls for change are echoing once again across this country. So many wondering, will this time be any different? While leaders debate what comes next, tonight we are thinking about the people on the front lines of this unthinkable attack, who along with so many, just want life the way it should be. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us from here in Lewiston, Maine. I'm Lindsay Davis. Have a good night. Please remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.